I'm leaning towards the bond market view that we're in for some volatility. We're kind of bouncing into a ceiling at a floor, effectively. We think the market's a little bit generous in terms of Fed cuts coming. The Fed has done a very good job of continuing to support the economy while raising rates and trying to tame inflation. I'm in the camp that it's not going to go neatly back to 2%. I think there's another upside surprise waiting out there in the inflation data. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keen and Lisa Bravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures just a little bit softer. Here's the top line from Secretary Yellen this morning. TK, you'll love this one. Time's running out for the debt ceiling conversation. I thought it was going to be the Boston Red Sox. You know, it's day by day, tick by tick, and we're going to stagger towards where something actually gets uh, done. I believe there's a meeting today. There is. Is that, is that like the first, you know, we moved from Secretary Yellen forward to an actual meeting with actual substance where they'll say, wait for Wednesday. Speaking of McCarthy and the President of the United States yes. coming up a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Compare and contrast this. From Brainerd over the weekend, the National Economic Council director saying the staff are very engaged. I'd characterize the engagement as serious, constructive. Speaker McCarthy says this. You'll love this, Lisa. Goes on to say, we're nowhere near reaching a conclusion. He found that ongoing staff level meetings are not productive at all. The talks so far have not produced agreement on anything. Do you think they've got different staff telling them different things about the state of conversations down in Washington, D.C.? I think that right now there is a different political calculus to seem like there's progress on one side and pro not making progress on the other side to try to negotiate perhaps a better deal. All I can say is it's clear as mud and people are so excited to talk about this yet again and that is definitely what's going to dominate. My favorite was Janet Yellen coming out and saying, look, this is making the U.S.'s borrowing costs more expensive if you look at the front end. It's like the one area of markets that actually starts to care. It's like, we're going to use that because that's all we got. We're already seeing us pay the price for this mess and the delay around the conversation. Secretary Yellen actually doubling down on her warning that the X state is going to fall sometime in early June and maybe as early as June 1st. We'll come back to that a little bit later. TK wants nothing to do with this conversation. Let's talk <laughs> the US consumer. Later on this morning, 8.30 Eastern time, US retail sales. We get some earnings from Home Depot. They're dropping right now. Lisa's going to go through that for you. Tomorrow, Target. After that, Walmart, just getting the top line from Home Depot right now. They see full year comp sales down two to five percent. They had seen it previously, Lisa, as approximately flat. So that's a slight downgrade to the outlook from them for sales. There is a question about whether this really is reflective of the broader consumer or whether this is a Home Depot specific and housing specific uh, type of story. Those shares lower by almost 5%. They said that it has to do with uh, lumber deflation and unfavorable weather. So perhaps there is something that is perhaps more specific to the industry <coughs> rather than a larger statement about the retailers, including right. Target tomorrow and Walmart on Thursday. Over the weekend, they made very clear it's been a very cold spring across this nation. Certainly, we've experienced that in New York with just the first warm days here in the last couple of days. So, yeah, weather's part of it. But lumber deflation really gets my attention, and you're going to see that across other products where they don't inflate. And, John, what you're going to get here is a feed through the income statement where you've got less inflation, less nominal GDP, that animal spirit of the nation, on a price in units basis, perhaps leading uh, to a lesser revenue in the non you go down the statement. Getting some commentary and some numbers as well. So the commentary reads as follows. They observed more broad-based pressure across the business. To Lisa's point, the weather in California disproportionately impacted Hell. the results. For the outlook, full-year EPS down 7 to 13 <clears> percent. <throat> Lisa, they had previously seen things down in the mid-single digits. So it's a downgrade to the outlook from Home Depot this morning. In a big way. I mean, the idea that fiscal year sales and, and comparable sales they see down 2 to 5% versus flat earlier really highlights this pressure. Again, how much is this a Home Depot issue and how much is this a broader kind of retailer issue? It's sort of well, one of the questions of how do you take the idiosyncratic stories and turn them into some sort of broader macro very, play? Very quickly, to flip it to a, a broader view, the Home Depot in Beijing had a tough time over the last months, too. We should not forget China statistics today were a little soggy. Disappointing. Tangential, Oof. but nevertheless disappointing. Point. We'll talk about the downside prices in China in just a moment. Home Depot in the pre-market, negative by more than 4%. Tomorrow, 
target the day after we'll hear from walmart as well the broader market just taking a move lower just a little one on s p 500 futures negative right now by 0.2 percent on the s p yields come in as well lisa by three basis points on a 10-year 346.63 we'll get a broader read on the retail sector at 8 30 a.m as you were mentioning we do get those retail sales and it's expected to be dominated by auto uh, purchases as well as what we see more broadly in gasoline however how much is this really going to be inflation driven home depot shares lower by almost five percent as you were saying as we get the sense that perhaps there is some sort of shift in the consumer 10 a.m I'm really focused on this, actually. Senate banking uh, hearing is going to be taking place with Silicon Valley Bank executives, including former CEO Gregory Becker, who says that it's the Fed's fault for uh, basically saying that rates were going to remain low and then raising them. And then at the same time, there is going to be a separate hearing uh, in front of the House Financial Services Committee with Fed Vice Chair for Supervision Michael Barr. So I really want a split screen of Greg Becker basically saying it's the Fed's fault, even though he sat on the board of the San Francisco Fed. But I digress. And then basically Michael Barr coming out and saying, terrible management. Yes, we could have done better, but, you know, banks are going to fail. And then also today, around 3 p.m., is that meeting between President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Do we get any sense of how these talks are progressing? The one area of the market that really cares is the one-month uh, one T-bill yield, which has gotten to about the highest since at least 2001. Wow. So we are seeing some moves on the front end, and Jenny Allen is going to talk about that. Imagine being an investor last year, sitting in tech stocks and getting absolutely hammered and turning around. Well, I listened to the Fed. <laughs> that and was they amazing. told me it was transitory. They told me it was transitory. Can you believe he's blaming the Federal Reserve for that? They told me it was transitory. Federal Reserve and social media. I mean, talk about finding the most convenient kind of blame, blame games in town. Wow. Marvin Lowe joins us now, Senior Global Macro Strategist at State Street. Marvin, wonderful to have you with us on the program. Tom wanted to talk about the note from Sockgen's Kit Jukes this morning. He said this, U.S. data will dominate sentiment and will probably deliver solid retail sales, decent industrial production. The debt limit remains a major issue, but for now, evidence <coughs> of recession is missing. Marvin, is recession evidence missing right now for you? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's certainly not clear. Um, I, I still think that a recession is unfortunately somewhat unavoidable after the banking uh, situation. And, you know, we're waiting for that to make its way through the economy. But the consumer is still strong. Jobs are still, uh, you know, robust based on the latest numbers. And inflation is proving sticky. I look, Marvin, at the inflation proving sticky. And yet there's a single headline from Home Depot. Granted, it's a commodity. Granted, it's volatile. But lumber deflation. Are we going to see more headlines like that? You know what? Uh, um, probably. You know, the good the good side of things has has been a bit more volatile in this discussion. Um, you know, it does come down to services, wages in this economy, um, and that's really where the Fed is focused on. Um, and it is the stickiest of the sticky, if you will, parts of uh, the inflation right. discussion. But on a global basis, I mean, I looked at copper very carefully this morning. I looked at Newcastle Coal in Australia, folks. This is north of Perth. And, you know, I, I look at these commodities, and the fact is they're rolling over, indicative of a slowing China, maybe a misguess on the Pacific Rim. How do you fold that into your investment allocation at State Street? Yeah, yeah I mean, I mean, for sure, it is signs that um, you've got growth problems that are starting to emerge as we go through, you know, the, the one year anniversary of this aggressive tightening cycle within the developed markets. Um, those recessionary signals are, are, all, are all over the place. Um, it is this kind of one slice of the American consumer that's making it um, harder to, to play. But I think if you can look past the timing of, um, of this consumer, which again, with some of these retail earnings, with some of this data that's coming out softer, you do get to a, a much slower growth type of uh, discussion. And, you know, if you're willing to, to put those investments in place, they're out there. Do you think that this is disinflationary to the degree that would give a, a bit of a reprieve to the Fed, especially if the stress that we're seeing in the banking sector is there, is real, but a slow burn that isn't going to necessitate some sort of real response? Yeah, for sure. So, so I definitely am in the camp that um, this credit tightening that I expect in the second half of the year is going to have a, a bigger impact on the economy than, you know, maybe some of these risk assets are saying, particularly on the default side of things, particularly on just overall um, loan growth slowing. And, and you do get um, a more disinflationary type of world once we get there. Um, it's, it, you know, the timing is, is really hard. It's not really the expertise of global macro to pick one month over another. Um, but, you know, going into 2024, I think that those headwinds uh, seem seem much stiffer. Where is uh, the debt ceiling debate on your radar? Are you excited? Do you wake up every morning to get a sense <laughs> of the machinations between the different discussion points that the two parties have? 
You know what? If um, if you talk to my coworkers, they would say I, I get overly excited about it. Um, so yeah, I I, I I certainly do think that um, the market is a bit uh, sanguine about it this time, particularly given the volatility on the um, deficit side of things. It's just a lot harder to pick the date when we're going to run out of money, um, and that really creates a problem for Washington, which seems to need that impetus to get things moving. Um, I'm also very cognizant of the amount of uh, reserves that moves around once we get the deal. Um, and that in and of itself creates more challenges for bank deposits, um, at least in the in the short term, potentially in the intermediate term, kind of just given how the shape of all these short term curves are, are somewhat um, inverted at this point. Marvin, let's say we knew the X date was June 1, June 1st. Would there be a different practical X date, a deadline that we had to really come to an agreement on to pass the legislation needed to ultimately skip the dreadful outcomes that most people are predicting if we do go through that X date? Yeah, I, I, I think there would be a greater sense of urgency for sure. Um, we are running out of time very, very quickly. Um, you know, the, the president is still uh, apparently going to the G7. So, um, you know, again, the litany of, of, uh, of conversations that are coming out of Washington show different degrees of, of concern. And that, uh, that in and of itself is a concern when you're talking about a date two, two weeks away. Um, so like how you get... How you get there is really some sort of hopefully acknowledgement that June first is a date that we should focus on and a temporary agreement to get us past, or else you know we go into territory that we've never been before. I thought you were done then, Marvin. Just got trigger happy on All this right. side of the desk. Marvin's like, yeah. killing it. My apologies. Killing it. I just hear the gap. And I'm like, it. Yeah. Let's go, Marvin. Low. <laughs> Stay straight. I'm worse than you. you. Marvin, thank you. You are. That's true. I won't disagree with that. Home Depot in the pre-market down by more than 4%, down close to 5% this morning, <clears throat> cutting the outlook for 2023. Going to read on the US consumer through the week. Retail sales come again in a couple of hours' time, Tom. Then it's on to Target, right. then on to Walmart. We talk about two-year yield collared. And, so, you know, you're making jokes with Bramo about the euro at 110. Collared as well. Home Depot's collared. And the range here coming off the pandemic celebration recovery. Everybody's down at Home Depot. John, I love the Milwaukee. 18 volt lithium island cordless belt sander, mm. really helpful at home. That's yeah, really see use that on the that. nails of the dogs. And uh, you know they're collared. Home Depot's collared 265. Sounds like to animal cruelty, <laughs> Don't know about you. <laughs> Sounds like he's a little bit sick of uh, the bills that he's paying at the uh, groomer. You okay. got that How do you right. Feel about that. Kyle. Do this every quarter. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah, let's go. Have you been to a Home Depot yet? No. Okay. There's one down below us. There's one right there. I right. know. He's You've never, never been? been? He's never been. Have you not done any home we'll improvement ever? No, I have the help go. Like Every paint? Every quarter. Still never been. Hooks? Pictures? No. No. <laughs> no. Stock is down by more than 4%. In the next me. hour, Ed Yardeni of Yardeni Research. U.S. retail I've sales about two hours away from New York. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> surveillance road trip to Home Depot. That's what we're working on. Yeah, keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. President Biden meets with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and other congressional leaders again today to try to avoid a default. And McCarthy says the two sides are nowhere near a deal to raise the debt limit. The standoff has been roiling markets as investors bet whether an agreement can be reached. Ukraine says its air defense system defeated what it called an exceptional Russian missile, bl missile blitz overnight. The attacks included six hypersonic missiles that were aimed at the capital city, Kyiv. Ukraine says it destroyed 18 Russian missiles. Global oil demand will rise more than expected this year because of China's post-pandemic rebounding. That's according to the International Energy Agency. The IEA says world fuel consumption will rise by 2.2 million barrels a day to a record 102 million. The agency expects demand in China to hit an all-time high. Wells Fargo has agreed to pay $1 billion to settle a shareholder lawsuit. The plaintiffs accused the bank of making misleading statements about its compliance with federal consent orders. Now, that was in the wake of the 2016 scandal over the opening of unauthorized customer accounts. Wells Fargo ended up paying $3 billion to settle the government probe. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
we're only a couple weeks away, but if you go to the timeline to pass something in the House and pass something in the Senate, you've got to have something done by this weekend. And we are nowhere near any of that. I appreciate the president sliding in to talk after 97 days, but there is no move. Round two of high-level talks. A little bit later today, there was High Speaker Kevin McCarthy sitting down with the President of the United States later on on the debt ceiling debate, saying that talks aren't constructive, they're <coughs> not productive. At the same time, Lael Brainerd is saying talks are constructive, they are somewhat <coughs> productive. You're loving this, aren't you, TK? I it with a passion. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you've got two weeks of it. Uh, oh, we, well, we may have more of that. You know, they're going to kick us the can. The can is kept in a hermetically sealed vault in Providence, Rhode Island. Who gets I, to kick it? I don't know who's going to kick it. That's maybe actually Kevin a good McCarthy? question. And maybe President Biden is like you know, who gets to kick the maybe can. Maybe it'll be a joint kick. Who plays Lucy and holds the damn can? Let's get to Probably the price Wendy action Show. briefly. <laughs> on the S&P 500, we are just a little bit softer on the S&P. We're negative by 0.14%. Yields a little bit lower by three basis points. Slightly defensive to kick things off this Tuesday. <clears> if you want a stock move, here it is. Home Depot trying to get up off the floor. We are negative by yeah. 4%. Coming out with earnings a little bit early this morning, about 20 minutes ago, 15 minutes ago, and ultimately indicating that the outlook has soured. It's not as good as it was before. They've had to cut the 23 outlook, Tom. This comes ahead of earnings a little bit later this week from Target, from Walmart. All of that's still to come and retail sales at 830 Eastern time. This goes back to goods and David Rosenberg talking about goods disinflation, good deflation. The headline is lumber deflation. And there's a lot of other things besides lumber. And you wonder where it's going to be. Uh, oil this morning, $71.11 is not $100 a barrel. You know, it's changed. I'm with you. The day trader China, <clears throat> do you want to talk about that? Downside surprise. Retail sales, industrial production, take your pick. Not looking good over there relative to the boom that people expected at this point of the year. We'll see that at 8.30 uh, this morning. Right now, not a history lesson, but where are we right now in the silliness of the debt ceiling uh, debate? Joining us as a real authority on this, Wendy Schiller is director of the Taubman Center for American Politics and Policy at Brown University. Okay, Wendy, so there's the Public Debt Acts of 1939 and World War II, 1941, and then we get to Eisenhower in 53, and the debt's an outrageous $275 billion, and the Senate has a conniption, and they call up Goldfinger, and they sell a billion dollars of gold at Fort Knox to cover the debt. I mean, that's the history of this madness. Are we repeating history, or is it new this time? Well, Tom, I think you're raising an excellent point about sort of the relative scale of debt. I mean, that's what's historical. I mean, right, it's just a huge amount of debt. Now, we can we handle it as far as GDP? Well, people say that we can. Uh, but even 1974, the Budget Control and Empowerment Act set deadlines for the debt ceiling, as you well know, May 15th. Yesterday was, you know, the traditional deadline. It was do or die. You had to do it by then. And basically the House and the Senate, no matter which party controlled it, you know, met the deadline under Ronald Reagan. And somehow that deadline, like everything else in Congress, has gone away. Uh, so right now they're facing, you know, just continuous raising of debt, continuous deficits. At some point, somebody's got to cut something. And we've been at least more than 10 years from a major mm -hmm. budget agreement to cut the budget. If Obama had to do it and Biden was his VP, you know, I think Biden recognizes that there are going to have to be some cuts made. I think they're looking for a short-term window, get a clean debt ceiling for the next couple of weeks, right. and hammer out a longer agreement. I mean, I, I got like 10 questions here and no time for it. Let me just cut to the chase as well. The cliche, kick the can down the road, translate that into modern political theory. Well, the, the, the fundamental fact is that most people, given the size of the federal government and the budget itself, cannot trace or track what their member of Congress does, senator or House member, or even the president, and the impact it has on their lives. You know, we keep hearing doom and gloom. The world's going to end. The stock market's going to crash. You know, nobody can buy a house. There'll be no mortgages. But people don't quite grasp it. And politicians know that people don't grasp it. So they can kick it down the road. They can find all sorts of gimmicks, and they can keep spending. And the other sort of dirty little secret is that Republican members of Congress still benefit from discretionary domestic spending in their districts. So they say they want to cut it. But in fact, if you try to cut agricultural spending, you know, good luck with that. Can't get it done. So this is the real conundrum, particularly the size and scope of the budget. Ed Yardini, who's going to be coming on the show of Yardini Research in about a half an hour time, says that he ultimately thinks that this is going to play out like 2011, except with a more clumsy kind of uh, legislative result. Do you agree? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I do. I think, well, I mean, I would say 2011 and 2013, right? So the grand bargain plus also shutting down the government by the Republicans on the budget side. And then the Republicans doing really well and taking the Senate back in 2014. Republicans do not see a downside to shutting down the government or having an interruption in the flow of federal dollars just for a little while because they want to show that the world will still go on. And given that that's the mentality, and even more so now than it was 10 years ago, that's a huge challenge for the Democrats. And where's the Senate in all this? I mean, they basically said, no, we're not going to take the House bill. We're done. But that's not responsible. So the Senate's a huge part of this. And it's the same balance of power scenario as 2011, Republican House, Democratic Senate, uh, Democratic President. So I think that's uh, I think that's the big problem. But they know they need a temporary clean because they're not going to get it done in two or three weeks. And I think can McCarthy get that through his caucus? And that is another pushing it back to McCarthy and the Republican caucus in the House. Wendy, you were saying that basically this has played well for the Republicans if you shut down the government for a bit. Is this how we can understand the difference in tone between Kevin McCarthy and Lael Brainerd, one saying that there's no progress and one saying talks are constructive? Sure. I mean, the rhetoric has to be, you know, the federal government is bad. That's what the GOP rhetoric is. They give more power to the states, you know, scale down the government, the federal government. And to do that, if you shut it down, um, then people will realize they don't need it. That never happens. Of course, once you shut it down, people realize they need it very badly in every aspect of their life, and the Republicans cave. But they get political credit for trying to control spending. So this is a playbook that has been very successful for them. And keep an eye on the 2024 House elections, because that's the eye. That's where Kevin McCarthy's attention is, is can they keep the House? Can they protect those New York and, and California Republicans newly elected? And he stays speaker. And that is all he cares about. And understanding what kind of deal he'll cut comes from that motivation. Wendy, just a final word. You alluded to this just a little bit. Have you got in mind what you think the practical deadline actually is going through all of this? <clears throat> I mean, it seems to me uh, end of June, early July, by July 4th, I think that's sort of symbolic. They also go on vacation uh, for a week or two, July 4th. I think that's something symbolic. And I think that if they haven't reached it, then not only is there sort of financial catastrophe, but I think there's a lot of political price to pay because they go home to their districts and they're going to hear about it. So you think that June 1 date is just a, per a little bit of cushion there, pad things out just a little bit from the Treasury? Yeah, you'd ho certainly hope with people this smart that they'd be strategic about that deadline and, and knowing, giving themselves a little bit of room there. And, uh, and I think they'll have to get a temporary clean one passed. You know, this is going to be another test of McCarthy and his power over his caucus. Wendy Schiller of Brown University. Wendy, thank you. As always, TK, you thought we only had a couple of weeks of this. You might have, <clears throat> say, six. You might get six weeks it's of this. It's a can down the road. What happens after six weeks? And the answer is in the Wikipedia, it's really cool. They have the debt ceiling raised by President Obama. Then you go down three paragraphs. The debt ceiling raised by President Trump. And then you go down three paragraphs. And they got the debt ceiling raised by President Biden. Why is there any other trend? I don't see any other available outcome other than to do this. And what I was doing while, while, while Wendy was talking there, I went and looked at the, the Kentucky public disbursements from the federal government. It's right. ginormous. What are you going to do? Cut off the checks to Senator McConnell's Kentucky? It's not going to happen. alluded to that, and your point of view <clears throat> from the investor perspective right now, and this is captured by the fund manager survey put out by Bank of America this morning, the global fund manager survey suggesting that it's overwhelmingly the consensus view, that it's not even viewed as a major risk, Bramo, because most people just assume this gets dealt with. And that's the reason why, if it does happen, where we do get some sort of shutdown, people will simply buy treasuries because it's a short-term disruption that will cause uh, the things to go along the way that they always have gone along. How much does this actually increase the risk of some sort of massive fissure if there isn't the sort of market pressure? I mean, really, I keep going back to this. It's a massive fissure dropping into a toxic brew. I just... Uh, stir it all I, up. I, 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 just, I, I just... He's trying to stir it up. I don't, I, big time. The, the, the massive debt ceiling fissure. I just... I, Most crowded trades here before. in the BFA survey. Yeah, I like your Long tweet big that. tech, short banks and short the US dollar. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Andrew Hollenhorst of City thinks you get a hike in June. He thinks you get another hike in July. Andrew Hollenhorst joins us next. Bramo romanticizing about freshly cut grass in the commercial break. Don't I mean, believe it me or like not. That. Believe it or not. It's amazing. <laughs> Amazing. I was tearing up. It wasn't it beautiful. <laughs> we'll come back to that another time. No, we so won't. Hey, fever. <laughs> we're not gonna. We're not gonna be coming back to that. <laughs> Pollen counts high today.
Just so you know, in New York. <laughs> Thank you for that Thank PSA. You. It's good. Anytime. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> okay. Your record market on the S&P 500, slightly negative by 0.1%. On the Nasdaq, totally unchanged. Yesterday, snap day, two-day losing streak, I think, on the S&P with some marginal gains. Check out the bond market. Let me go through some levels for you. Two-year, 10-year. The average on the two-year over the last month, 4.02%. Right now, 398. The average on the 10-year over the last 30 days, 347.58. Right now, 347. The equity market hasn't done much for a month, and I have to say the bond market hasn't done much. It's kind of like the bumpy road to nowhere. But something did break in the last week. Euro-dollar did. In the FX market, this currency pair, this was the biggest move lower for this currency pair going back to September last year. Trying to bounce back from that and reclaim 109, 108.93. But I have to say the data is starting to turn in Europe in an interesting way. We had the German ZEW Investor Confidence read a little bit earlier. It's not that well followed compared to, say, the Business Confidence EFO index, which we talk about a whole lot more. But mm. it's another one, Bramo, on top of a few others that I think we have to pay attention to, that things in Europe may be not going in the right direction. And I'd throw into your toxic brute the latest data out of China as well. I would completely agree. This is sort of the tailwind that really maybe is already used up or already getting a sense of perhaps not being as strong as people previously thought. There was a belief that Europe could somehow emerge sort of dominant and stronger than the U.S. And people are checking that, especially as earnings other than Home Depot usually are coming out better than expected. This is pushing back against a big, big consensus view. I'm not saying that consensus has shifted. But you're starting to see a change emerge from the likes of Mislav Mateka at JP Morgan dropping that overweight Europe versus the United States saying this. The activity upswing seen around the turn of the year, which was helped by the falling gas prices in Europe and by China reopening, is unlikely to transition into an acceleration in the second half. That's the story for Europe, for some of the data. Let's get to Home Depot. Lisa mentioned it. Home Depot in the pre-market was down almost 5% at one point. It's negative four right now. Came out a little bit early this morning in the last 30 minutes or so, Tom basically cutting the outlook for 2023. <clears throat> and this tees us up for a broader conversation around the consumer this morning with retail sales yes. onto tomorrow with Target, the day after with Walmart. Widely expected, widely anticipated that we would see some form of slowdown. It was greater than expected. And at every level, it just simply came in greater than expected. And as you mentioned, John, the outlook was uh, tepid, to be polite. Big week for the consumer and for the Fed speak too. A slew of Fed speak today. You're going to hear from the following. Mester <clears throat> Williams, Goresby, Logan, Bostick and a whole lot more. Chairman Powell on Friday. Andrew Hollenhorst the City weighing in on the mess on what we might expect and what we might hear from the chairman running the following. He is unlikely to signal a bias for actions at a mid-June FOMC meeting, instead emphasising that policymakers will be data dependent. The crucial information will be whether Powell echoes his colleagues' <coughs> concern that inflation is at risk of getting stuck above 2%. Tom, yeah. I have to say some splintering in the Fed speak yeah. in the last 24 hours. Maybe led by the former Vice Chair Richard Clarida. We've been wonderful to have him grace our show on the Fed Day. And it's a percolated debate about the above 2% idea. Let's go to Andrew Hollenhorst right now. He's Chief U.S. Economist at Citigroup, acclaimed for really being out front on a set of rate increases many people did not see coming. Andrew, I want to go to the unspeakable which is the three-month Treasury bill has gone back up to 07, 08 levels. What is the ability of the three-month Treasury, given what you see at Citigroup, to go up to where it was in 1999-2000, to get up to a 6% level? Yeah, so it is interesting, Tom, that we've seen these rates that have gone up quite rapidly as the Fed has responded to inflation. And I, I think that's where I would just take the conversation back to it. It, it really still all depends on inflation. What John was just talking about, I and mean, we have some different views across the committee. I think that's a healthy thing. There's some discussion now. Is inflation going to get stuck above 2%? Is it going to come down towards 2%? Right. Markets are expecting a pretty rapid slowing in inflation. Um, Fed officials are a little bit more cautious about that. But if you look at where they have their forecast at the end of this year, they have core PCE inflation around 3.5%. So they really do see it slowing. In that world, you're going to see those short rates that aren't going to go a lot higher than where they are now. Um, in a world where right. inflation stays higher, you, you you could start thinking about higher policy rates again. People like you are taking all sorts of different inflation measurements. I noticed Goldman Sachs publishing this morning off their London desk a trimmed core CPI number. Should our viewers and listeners be looking at fancy economic inflation metrics, or should they, like the Fed, just be looking at core CPI and top CPI? So I, I think you want to look at all of it. That, that's really the approach that we take. There are so many different measures of inflation you can look at, to your point, Tom. 
Um, the Atlanta Fed has an underlying inflation dashboard. All of those metrics are, are, are running quite high. You want to be careful, though, because if we start getting into the game of, you know, let's throw out this component, let's add this component, let's adjust this component, you can get any inflation number that, that you want. If we just look at the monthly core CPI readings, they've all been for the last five months or so um, right around a four or five percent reading. So you know, like John was talking about, you actually have some, you know, kind of stability on average and in, in certain indicators. And core CPI is one of those indicators where it's just kind of consistently coming in around five percent annualized. And that's a problem for the Fed. Andrew, do you think this effort is time sensitive or does the Federal Reserve have the luxury of pushing out the appropriate time horizon to get inflation back to target? So it's not going to make a big difference to the economy if the Fed hikes in June or waits in June, maybe hikes later on. So on the economic fundamentals, that timing is not crucial. But on the communication, the timing can be extremely important because if the Fed doesn't hike in June, if the Fed guides that they're going to be on hold, then the market is going to price back in cuts. And that's kind of what the Fed has been dealing with. And if the market prices in cuts and you get a lower 10 year yield, you get more stimulus for the economy. By the way, the housing market is bottomed. It's coming back now off of that bottom. Um, so, so that kind of communication is what the Fed is managing more than anything else when they're deciding what to do on a meeting by meeting basis. Economically, um, they are in a situation now where you know, I would agree with St. Louis Fed President Bullard saying that policy rates are now at the, the lower end of a reasonable range of what could be restrictive. Um, so they want to be looking at data. That's what they're doing, depending on where that data comes in, um, is going to determine their next step. With that in mind, Andrew, given that we are seeing very subtle signs, and I put the emphasis on subtle, that we're seeing some splintering on the committee, just a different range of views, subtle shifts over the last 24 hours. Does the chairman not have a role to play this week to get a hold of the narrative? and really push forward with what you're indicating? So the chairman has a big role to play. I think the question is whether he is going to play that role this week or that's something that we're going to wait a little bit later for. Um, the issue with this week is we have a core CPI reading. We're waiting for a core PCE reading. We're waiting for a jobs report. We're waiting for another CPI inflation report that's going to come out right ahead of the June FOMC meeting. So when you're in this very data-dependent period, it's going to be hard for any Fed official to push too hard towards either being on hold or towards hiking. Um, you really want to see the data. So I, I think that's more what we're going to hear from Chair Powell. Yes, at some point he needs to bring this committee together because we are hearing very different views on inflation. Some Fed officials calling it discouraging, some Fed officials calling it encouraging. Um, ultimately, Chair Powell is going to have to bring the committee together. In a little bit, we're going to be speaking with Eddie Ardeni, who thinks that if disinflation continues the pace that we've currently seen, the CPI could reach 3 to 4 percent by Christmas. And this is their wonderful life forecast that stocks seem to be buying into. How do you push back against that? I understand that the housing market is rebounding, but some of that hasn't even gotten factored into that weakness, into uh, CPI as is. How do you push back at a time where there are signs of disinflation? Yeah, so, so no doubt you have goods prices that have slowed. You have shelter prices that are slowing. Now, if I look at forward-looking indicators, it's not as clear that that slowing is going to continue. The important thing to keep in mind in annual, analyzing inflation is that this is a dynamic process. Um, so we had shelter prices that were running very strong. They're still running strong, but they're cooling. Goods prices were strong, and they've cooled. This has shifted now into non-shelter services inflation. And that is probably the worst place for inflation to be showing up. That's where it has the potential to be most pernicious, most persistent, most long lasting. So I would really be concerned if I were a Fed official about what's going on in services inflation. I wouldn't take it too seriously, but I would be a little bit concerned about University of Michigan five to 10 year inflation expectations that moved up to 3.2%. Um, I think that's more kind of you know, qualitative than quantitative, but that's the highest reading that we've seen in some time. That's telling you that these inflation expectations are becoming embedded in the economy. Andrew, are the debt ceiling debates and the discussions that we keep hearing and the likely uh, fiscal cuts that are probably going to follow, is that disinflationary? If there were going to be cuts to spending, that, that would be disinflationary. But 
remember, as we're hearing about the negotiations around the debt ceiling, the, the caps on spending are probably not going to apply to overall spending. There'll be certain categories of discretionary spending that get capped. Things like defense spending can continue to grow. That can be inflationary. So I, I'm not sure that what we get out of this is ultimately going to be all that deflationary. Andrew, looking for hikes in June, looking for hikes in July. Andrew Hollenhorst and a team over at City together with Veronica Clark. Great to catch up with you, Andrew, as always, buddy. Your equity market, negative 0.1% on the S&P. I'll keep going through the calendar, the diary for you this morning, 8.30 Thank Eastern you. time. U.S. retail sales a little bit later on today. We'll hear from Speaker McCarthy and President Biden in their debt ceiling negotiations, TK. Then on to tomorrow. When is this this afternoon? Target, then Walmart coming up on when, Thursday. When, when, you know, 3 p.m. Eastern time, time, I believe. Close? 3 p.m. That's sort of when their day starts, I imagine by it? the time that's concluding that they come out and do those individual press conferences. Yeah, you know the, the, side, ones the driveway. We love yeah. those. They get um, in the driveway, <clears throat> get in front of the mic. Yeah, anne has got a said, There's no progress. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, what Wendy Schiller said I thought was fascinating, that basically there is no incentive for Republican uh, representatives to come out and say that there was a lot of progress because this is something that plays well for the constituents. So how do you read <clears throat> the Democrats coming out and saying, it was fantastic. We had such a good collaborative oh, no, They're not going to say that today. Saying, I mean, the, uh, you know, are we serious? Seriously, are we right today? They're going to say they're making progress. The staff is talking, but they totally disagree, right? Because they're playing to their constituencies. I have no idea because I don't have a crystal ball about what they may or may not say. I can tell you what they have said. That's our orb, isn't it? That's our orb. (laughs) Yes. I can tell you what they have said. (laughs) Kevin McCarthy coming into this has basically suggested there has been no progress. Does he stay on repeat? A little bit later. Well, and again, how much is the incentive? We see you. We see you, Tom. What did uh-huh. you learn from that? Did we ever find out what that was about? <laughs> this is, folks, <laughs> the, for the those of you without the uh, unfortunate. Yeah, I do. This was Remember Saudi that? Arabia yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. President yeah, yeah. Trump what looking was that at about? some. It what was, was that? I still don't know. They it, all had the orb. It was the golden glow of OPEC and the That's what it experience was? of connecting. And I have no clue. I think I mean, there was actually something serious to it that was lost on Western minds. Oh, there was. I think so. What's important about this? You know, Bramo gets me going and, I, you know, you, guys, you guys don't know this, but I'm trying to help Mayor Adams here and I got the mower out. I mean, I, you know, I'm trying to help Home Depot as, as well. And John, for $82 large, you're into a push mower to help most Central Park. Is that I how mean, much a push mower costs? It's it? like, yeah, it's like, you know, it's made in Asia and it's great and, you know, you got to resharpen Are it. they really like $82 now? Wow. Yeah, yeah. well, the locks are a million dollars. I used to have a lock, which is a fancy golf I used to work that, that petrol one when oh, I was a kid. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Do the, do the yeah. back lawn. We call yeah. that Briggs and Stratton, American engines. Is that what it was, Briggs and Briggs Stratton? And Stratton. It takes sure. forever to sure get it started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then, like, a puff of, like, gas comes out. Arr, that's and you it. smell that's it. it. You know, you know I take it down. I take it down to get it <laughs> sharpened. It's yeah. great. John, I take yeah. it down to get it sharpened. Madison in the 70s somewhere. You know, the sharpened. And then you go out into Central Park. With a cigar. I can't see that. That right. At all. The cigar piece of it. Absolutely. Every afternoon in Central Park, you can find TK with a cigar. Equity futures on ESP, negative 0.1%. Chuck Grum, Gordon Haskett on retail earnings coming up next. And he'll also be with a beverage of his choice as well. You know that. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The White House and congressional leaders heading to another session of debt limit talks today to try and avoid a default. President Biden has said he was optimistic a deal could be reached, while House Speaker Kevin McCarthy expressed that ongoing discussions were not productive at all, and leaders are nowhere near reaching an agreement. The former CEO of Silicon Valley Bank says the Fed and social media contributed to the lender's collapse. Greg Becker testifies before the Senate Banking Committee today. He's expected to blame the fastest pace of hikes by the Fed in decades. According to his prepared remarks, Becker also will point a finger at negative social media sentiment. Global News powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. today's environment where there's so much uncertainty in the economy, I don't think we can really rule out anything. If I had to have a vote right now, I'd probably vote to hold. Uh, but as you noted, uh, we, got, we got two more inflation readings. We have a jobs number, a jobs report that's got to come out. There's a lot more information we're going to have as to what's going on. 
Great conversation with Mike McKee and Raphael Bostic there, the Atlanta Fed Bank president. Tons more <coughs> coming from the Fed this week, including Chairman Powell on Friday. Going into all of that, your equity market more broadly, just a little bit softer this morning. We're negative by 0.1%, a whole lot softer, more negative than that. Home Depot in the pre-market, <coughs> down by almost 5% out about 45 minutes or so ago, coming out and cutting the outlook, Tom, for 2023. Comparable sales could decline between 2 and 5% this year. They've blamed a whole bunch of things. Unfavorable weather, lumber deflation yeah. contributing to the drop. I think other people might have a different view on things. There's a wide set of ideas here, and I, I do suggest weather comes into it, but that's always been true. They're up 17% per year for the last 10 years, and I think weather debates have been there each and every quarter, good, bad, and indifferent. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to go to the weather. Have you noticed it's only FX when it's bad? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, and it's thing. only weather when it's bad. But when it's good, it's us. I was going to say <laughs> the exact same it's thing. Us. It's a how much is weather the new FX trade, this dollar Total. strength, the dollar fluctuations, yeah. or whatever it is that we've got. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk to an expert. <laughs> uh, we're not, I mean, Lisa's an expert on this because she's at Home Depot three times a week. John and I are clueless on this. Somebody really competent is Charles Grom. Chuck Grom is senior retail analyst at Gordon Haskett and joins us right now and what's so very cool about this out of the college of the holy cross is this is one of the coolest things on the securities research side this gentleman is a cpa and a cfa and that is bulletproof across wall street combine the two combine the accounting chuck and also the financial analysis of the cfa designation is home depot a different company than the company we've known for 20 years no, not at all. I mean, I think there's a lot going on with the consumer right now, and and, and you touched on it um, in terms of the weather impact. But I think the key line out of the Home Depot release today was demand uh, starting to normalize. And I think that's something we haven't heard from Home Depot in, in quite some time. And I think that's the big issue. And understanding how long that's going to last is really going to weigh on shares here in the near term. But but when you, let's face it, I mean, March was was very unfavorable from a weather perspective, but April wasn't. And we don't know the exit rate for the month of, of right. April, right now, but we suspect it was weak. And so you can't hide behind weather right now. One of the distinctions they have is they own the pro market, or at least that's the verbiage. Do they still own the pro market? And is that the Home Depot distinction forward? <clears throat> oh, 100%. I mean, let's face it, nothing really structurally has changed here with Home Depot. The stock's down a little bit pre-market. They didn't have a great first quarter. They're, they're cutting the guide for the year. But pro business, north of 50% of their sales, they still they still dominate that part of the market, particularly relative to peers. Lowe's is way behind at close to 25%. So again, that has not changed at all today. How much is this really a housing specific sector issue, a construction related uh, issue, just simply because there has been so much investment in people's homes, there has been purchases and prices have gone up so much? Yeah, I think it's I think it's it's all of that. I think demand normalization again is the key here. Um, but you know, w when rates are this high, people are not moving. But let's say that people have jobs, so they're still investing in their homes. We're just seeing category demand normalization across the board. Um, and I and I do think that their seasonal business will learn more on the nine o'clock call it was also soft because of some of the issues with weather here. We are seeing low shares uh, down in sympathy, as you can see, yep. those shares down almost four percent as well. Yep. So people seeming to believe this is a sector specific issue. T uh, moving ahead to Target tomorrow and then Walmart on Thursday, how much are we going to see a similar trend in those retailers at a time when a lot of different stores are saying that they can pass along price increases and then some? I think retailers are going to have a much harder time, you know, taking price from here. I think we're starting to see the consumer push back. We're seeing consumers start to trade down into companies like Walmart and into categories and, and private brands in particular. Um, so we're we're cautious on Target. We're we're more optimistic on, on Walmart. I think that the key thing here is we're starting to go through a discretionary recession across retail. And I think we're actually already in it. And I think we're going to start to hear that from a lot of companies over the next couple of weeks. If you rewind the clock, you know, the past couple of weeks we've heard from Costco, their business has been softer. It's very atypical for Costco to have that volatility in their business. So if Costco's volatility is there, Home Depot's business is softening. Right. Better it's happening everywhere. One of my big themes, Chuck, is management's adapt. How does retail adapt to the slowdown you describe? Is it layoffs? Is it protect the margin and EBITDA at all costs? What's the prescription here looking at history? Well, I mean, the, the number one thing they need to do is protect the balance sheet and, and control inventory levels. And if there's anything that could happen in 2022 was demand started to soften and, and inventories started to get in better shape. Are they there? 
yet not really across the board, but they'll start to get there. And you know, for Home Depot, their their SGA expense control was 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 very very good in the first quarter. That's why even with softer business, they were they were able to come in with earnings of 382. So the first thing will be inventory. Second thing will be be cost control. And I think the the third leg would be would be job cuts down the road if business continues to deteriorate. Chuck, that <clears throat> phrase discretionary recession. Can we dig into that just a little bit more? Is that sure. up and down income brackets? Does that go from goods to services? Can you give me a little bit more detail on what you're looking for there? Well, I think it's a little bit more goods than services right now. I mean, you look at the travel industry and anybody that's been at the airport or been on an airplane in the past few months, they're always full. So people are, are definitely shifting spend towards services. But I think it's the categories that that my my companies sell into. We're just seeing softness across the board. You know, whether it's whether it's consumer electronics, whether it's home furnishings, whether it's home improvement. In this in this case, um, you know, again, all three of those are, are starting to see weakness. Chuck, how much is this going to really challenge the the fact that companies have been raising prices beyond their input prices? In other words, that profit margin has to come in much more than people are expecting. Yeah, I mean that's a really good point, and I mean, and and that's where we're going to have to watch the elasticity across the board. Um, you know, we're starting to see it in discretionary areas start to normalize on the price front. We'll start to see it in in CPG areas, food areas, and in, in the coming months as inflation starts to starts to pull back. Um, I'll just point out that just traffic across retail has been very very soft over the past two months, and that's always a harbinger of things to come. And it doesn't look good. The consumer's pulling back. And and frankly, like the, none of this should be a surprise um, after the past couple of years of, of splurging across the consumer yeah. space. Chuck, I'm looking at this weekend buying the American push mower for $82 from Home Depot. I mean, we got to mow Central Park. I got to do my part for Mayor Adams. Where's their perfume section? What part of Home Depot is where they really make the margin as they get to 16% EBITDA? Uh, it, it's really pretty even across the board. Um, it really in the seasonal areas, home furnishing area, that that's where the margins tend to be the best. But if you go back to here, that this print for for Home Depot again, like it, it's not pretty, but the gross margins are actually pretty well protected, and their inventory levels are in good shape. So it's not a great print from Home Depot this morning, but it's also not the end of the world in my opinion. Chuck, this was smart. Let's do this again yeah. soon. Chuck Grom there right. of Golden Haskett. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. That <clears> phrase, <throat> discretionary recession. Just making notes as Chuck was talking, consumer elect electronics, home improvements, Lisa, home furnishing. Are we going to see that later this week in Target and Walmart as well? And he says yes. And he says that traffic has been really light and that that's a leading indicator. And he thinks yeah. that in general consumers are pulling back. But to me, the fact that this is the leading signs at a time when the consumer is king and that's what's been driving all the upside surprises in both inflation as well as growth oh. doesn't bode that well. And John, you mentioned this yesterday. I think it just goes back to charge card usage. You really, you know, we got we got productivity coming out today and a bunch of bow tie economic stuff, baloney. It's about charge cards and about what people are actually doing with credit in this in, in this in this time. Not only small business, but individuals as well. We started to see some signs of that. I think that got drowned <clears throat> out by the regional banking issue. Yes, but from the major banks, Lisa, we started to see some signs of that. Just credit starting to build. Starting to see people carry over balances month to month. The kind of things you start to see where weakness starts to come through. We got that survey yesterday from the New York Federal Reserve, and it showed that credit card receivables, the outstanding balances, have not gone down in the first quarter for the first time for the same kind of period in 20 years. Normally, people pay off the bills from Christmas time, from the holidays. They did not do that this year, and that really raises some flags to some when people. When do you have the time to look for that data? I mean, are you sitting at home waiting for the charge card data? To... Yes, some, I some, am. Some, some of us like to read some of that data. <laughs> hold on, with the, it's really hold interesting. on with the homework, guys. The Fed's coming out with charge card data. Actually, no joke. I actually do call the kids over. I'm like, check this out. Isn't this interesting? And their eyes start to glaze over, and they start to look at their phone. And I, I say, no, this is important. It's nice Child that you abuse. share that with them. I think it's nice. <laughs> Basically, I might as well be talking to them well, all. I'm watching right. the new Pitch Perfect 3 at home. That's, you know, that's it's that a little oh, It's just great. Yeah. This is some really important stuff, though, guys. I mean, look, Doug Cass this morning writing in almost immediately and saying this is classic pull forward in demand. Just like some of the tech names, we saw that with the likes yeah. of Home Depot. People doing things with their homes through the pandemic, all of that good stuff. We pushed out demand for travel and leisure when it came to airlines and flying and vacations and all of that stuff. So how long, Bramo, before we see this go from goods to services? This is what people are expecting, yeah. the disinflation that Adair Dini talks about. Cass is down in Florida. He's got two parrots in his house. One's called LIFO, the other's called FIFO. Is that right? Can you yeah, confirm that? Yeah, I can confirm I'm sure that's true. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs>
I'm leaning towards the bond market view that we're in for some volatility. We're kind of bouncing into a ceiling at a floor, effectively. We think the market's a little bit generous in terms of Fed cuts coming. The Fed has done a very good job of continuing to support the economy while raising rates and trying to tame inflation. I'm in the camp and it's not going to go neatly back to 2%. I think there's another upside surprise waiting out there in the inflation data. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide on TV and radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Your equity market just about negative on the S&P 500. Big week for the U.S. consumer later on this morning, 8.30 Eastern time, retail sales in America. Target numbers tomorrow. Walmart earnings the day after that. This morning, Home Depot, that stock is negative by 4% in the pre-market after cutting its outlook for 2023. TK blaming lumber... <laughs> deflation, disinflation, take your pick, and also the weather. But I think yeah. a lot of other people going this morning a little bit further than that. Well, Chuck Brown was great there, and I think Lisa really underscored it, the idea of units through the door. It is about bodies, and whatever it is in retail, you got to get them through the door, whether it's physical or online, and that seems to be the problem, and that leads to a diminished comp sales statistic or set of statistics, I, I should say. And what we've got to remember is this is a dominant, well-executed machine, sort of the Apple computer of retail, if you will. And if, if Home Depot's struggling like this, what are the others doing? Maintaining margins. Chuck Grum talked about that at Gordon yeah. Haskett. But then he came out with this phrase, and I think this phrase got the attention of all of us. Discretionary recession. He went through things line by line. Consumer electronics, home improvements, home furnishing. Doug Cass, as he said 10 minutes ago, <clears throat> Lisa, we had this big pull forward of demand in certain parts of consumer spending, and, and this was one. This is the reason why I'm looking at target shares in uh, pre-market trading down 1.6 percent, Lowe's shares down more than 3 percent. The sympathy trade here points to something that is larger than just a Home Depot story. And perhaps this is just because people are jumpy, but really uh, any kind of forward look that perhaps there was this brought fo bringing forward of demand that now is cooling at a rapid pace is concerning for people who, again, keep leaning on the consumer to defy all expectations of weakness. So I think the first two questions you and I both had. Is this up and down the income brackets? Does this go beyond goods to services? Because services have been really robust. We were talking about the airlines through this week and airline spending. Anyone who's been to an airport knows that things are booming right now, Bramo. Does that start to fade as well? This is really the issue for a lot of people. And I know that, for example, Ed Yardeni has been talking about the disinflation that is expected to happen at an increasing pace. This is what the stock market's banking on, that this will actually cause a massive disinflation that will allow a soft landing. And this is the reason why things are going to end up being much better uh, than all of the naysayers and bears out there I say. don't think you can do a static analysis. Yes, disinflation is going to lead to a lower nominal GDP, some pressures including on retail, but all in all, it's, there's, it's ambiguous. There's going to be other advantages there. And I'm going to go to the optimism of someone like Neil Dutta that says, hey, you know what? Less inflation, actually better inflation-adjusted incomes across the many deciles of America. So it cuts both ways. I do a more dynamic analysis there. So where does that leave the Federal Reserve? We've got a range of views in the last 24 hours. President Kashkari, we have a long way to go before we get inflation back down. On the other side of things, I would say President Goolsby of Chicago indicating that May was a close call for him. Speaking to CNBC in the last 24 hours, well, this is... we have a long way to go over in Minneapolis, over in Chicago. I think we need to be extra mindful. Two different views this there, is... TK, at the moment. Yes, it's really important. I'm glad you brought this up. We made a joke yesterday. There's 432 Fed speakers this week. Got some traction. But they're all different. And Goolsby has... A character and mindset, I'm going to blame it on the, the giant Gary Becker Chicago, of looking at a more complex, holistic analysis rather than the algebra of two plugins of our start. The bottom line is everybody's pushing back against the idea of rate cuts before year end. And the market's sort of buying it, kind of moved a little bit yesterday, and then kind of retraced some of that. So I think your point, John, about what role does Jay Powell have to play in basically putting a cap on this, saying, we don't care what happens, we're not cutting rates. I mean, again, that will be a read my lips kind of moment, but still. Just starting to see this subtle split splintering, aren't you, Correct. between Fed views in the last 24 hours. And I said this earlier this morning, I put the emphasis on subtle. <clears throat> it is really subtle, but I wonder if this is one of those weeks where the chairman has to come out and get hold of the narrative. Should we do the debt ceiling stuff? I know you love uh, this, TK. Compare me. and contrast this 
Brainerd, formerly of the Federal Reserve and now of the administration, over the weekend, talking about the debt ceiling negotiations at the staff level, said the staff are very engaged. They'd characterise the engagement as serious, as constructive. Kevin McCarthy, the Speaker of the House, coming out and saying this. We're nowhere near reaching a conclusion. He said that ongoing staff level meetings are not productive at all. The talks so far have not produced, Tom, quote, agreement on anything. That's kind of the groundwork how the stage is set a little bit later for talks between the Speaker and the President. To look at the Republican side, the only time there's going to be agreement is when somebody goes, we can't cut the Social Security check in Kentucky or Florida and name a bunch of other states as well. And you can take it right over to the left as well. That's the sole catalyst I've ever witnessed. Next stop for this market, 8.30 <coughs> Eastern time. U.S. retail sales right now in the equity market on the S&P 500, negative by not even a tenth of 1%. It's come back. Home Depot is negative 4%. I can tell you that joining us right now is Ed Yardeni of Yardeni Research. Been looking forward to catching up with Ed this morning. Ed joins us right now. Ed, let's talk about this. Are there reasons to be bullish this morning for you? Well, I think that uh, the economy has uh, been proven to be quite resilient. We have been in a recession. Uh, we've discussed this before. It's been a rolling recession. And notwithstanding that, consumers continue to spend uh, Multifamily housing uh, continues to uh, be built. And then we have a lot of infrastructure spending that's still ahead of us and onshoring. So put it all together, we have an economy that's uh, faring remarkably well. Ed, you had a resiliency to be in the equity markets, given your economic analysis. It was pretty grim last October into November. And you said, look, the gloom is just not applicable is it applicable now or can you still say stay on board american equities well i i thought in late october that we might have made a low on october 12th of last year and that was mostly because uh, i saw a tremendous amount of pessimism out there uh, as much as there was back in early 2009 and surely things aren't anywhere near as bad as they were back then. I mean, maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe this banking crisis will morph into something as ugly as that. But I certainly doubt that. And so I think that, you know, as uh, Chauncey Gardner once said uh, in the movie Being There, the book too, uh, in the spring there will be growth. Um, a lot of forecasters were anticipating a, an economy-wide recession by now. They were expecting that earnings would tank, and the second quarter earnings season has gone fairly well. What do you make of this idea of a discretionary recession that we're beginning to see, perhaps in the earnings of Home Depot, perhaps in the earnings that we may get throughout the remainder of this year? Well, I think we have had a recession in the goods sector. Uh, consumers pivoted away from buying goods to buying services. And as a result of that, retailers got caught with a lot of inventories that they didn't expect that they would have to hold. And so they discounted and they stopped their ordering. So there has been a recession in the goods sector, I would say, for about six months. I, I hope this is the tail end of it, and uh, we'll, we'll see how, as you said, the Home Depot uh, issue uh, suggests that we're not out of the woods yet uh, with regards to goods. But people are traveling, the airports are busy, the restaurants are packed, uh, a lot of baby boomers my age are retiring, and uh, what do they do all day? I guess they play golf and they go out to eat, and they travel. <laughs> Well, Ed, as they travel around and go out to eat, there is this sort of divide between those who see this as a more persistent inflationary input for longer and those who see this as, uh, as something that simply supports the economy while other areas right. disinflate. That's sort of the wonderful life uh, scenario that you put out there. How do you draw the distinction? When do you say, OK, people who are just retired and playing golf and traveling around all day are going to boost inflation to a degree that's going to be uncomfortable? How do you push back against that? Well, I think it is going to turn out that uh, the truth about inflation is somewhere between transitory and persistent. I mean, it's definitely been transitory on the goods side. Uh, we've kind of ran trip on inflation there, particularly in durable goods, but even in non-durable goods. Even food inflation is moderating, and people thought that that would uh, be persist. Uh, transportation costs for hauling around food and other uh, commodities and goods that inflation rates come down dramatically. So we're still stuck with the services inflation rate. A lot of that is rent. We know that rent inflation is already coming down on a three month annualized basis. And then we've got that kind of sticky core super <coughs> inflation rate, whatever uh, you know, the Fed likes to call it. Uh, I think that'll moderate. I mean, that, that's the one that's hard to predict. 
Uh, but I think if you got disinflation kind of right. across the so for one area, it'll 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 uh, disinflate too. I just have a Edgar Denny Yale question right now on monetary theory. Can a central bank have as part of its management financial stability? There seems to be a primal call for central bankers to do more than in the U.S. inflation and jobs. Can they actually manage as doctrine financial stability? Well, I, I wish that the uh, dual mandate was uh, only one mandate. Uh, the central banks really should just focus on financial stability. If we have financial stability, I think it implies that they have to keep inflation down. I think financial stability is good for the labor markets. Uh, this uh, you know, dual mandate that we have, uh, I think, is doesn't have its priorities straight. And the other central banks are also have as a top priority bringing keeping inflation down. And I think making financial stability the top priority would do that as well. Uh, the Fed, as you know, just put out a financial stability report, and it was re remarkably calm. Uh, they didn't seem to be phased at all by the banking crisis. Uh, I, I hope it's not arrogance uh, on, on their part. They, they seem to believe that they've uh, managed to contain it and that uh, uh, they, they've done a good job there. Ed, appreciate your insight. Always enjoy listening to you. Ed Yardani there of Yardani Research. I think we all hope the Fed's not being arrogant right here. What sounds so bad about golf all day? I think that sounds great. <laughs> I think that sounds great, that sounds too. Great. No, golf I mean, I mean, when we get to retirement, can I just say, why do we call it financial stability when markets go down, but not when markets go up? I mean, for 10 years, when markets were going up in an unsustainable way, nobody was saying, I'm worried about financial stability. They should really get monetary policy in line with it. But all of a sudden, <laughs> markets potentially could go well, down in their risks, and then all of a sudden, it's an issue. Wasn't there a whole institution of perma bears that was saying exactly that <laughs> for like a decade? Yeah, they were just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that was the issue. But, you know, why are people calling on the Fed to respond to that? Just saying. TK. Perma bears for a decade. That's a really core. It is tough to be permanently bearish. It is really You're difficult. telling me. You get to sound really smart difficult. for a long time, though. Nah, Every 10 anymore. years, you're brilliant. <laughs> no, seriously. Joe Granville it's 101. True. Every it's 10 true. years, you're brilliant. True. I agree. You know, that's all there is to it. Equity futures on the S&P, negative by 0.1%. Isaac Bortanski of BTIG on the debt ceiling coming up next. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. President Biden meets with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and other congressional leaders again today to try and avert a default. McCarthy says the two sides are nowhere near a deal to raise a debt limit. The standoff has been roiling markets as investors bet whether an agreement can be reached. There's a sign that economic uncertainty is now leading is now leading to a pullback in home improvement spending. Home Depot cut its outlook for the year after the first quarter sales dropped more than expected. Comparable sales were down 4.5 percent the first three months. The company says earnings could fall as much as 13 percent this year. It's another sign that former Vice President Mike Pence is preparing to run for the Republican nomination for president. Pence's allies have formed a political action committee to support him. Pence has said he'll announce before late June whether he will challenge his former boss, Donald Trump. Ukraine says its air defense system defeated what it called an exceptional Russian missile blitz overnight. Now, the attacks included six hypersonic missiles that were aimed at the capital city, Kyiv. Ukraine says it destroyed 18 Russian missiles. Bloomberg's learned that U.S. regulators will challenge Amgen's $27.8 billion deal to buy Horizon Therapeutics. The FTC is expected to file a lawsuit today. It'll argue that the combination would hamper innovation and slow the pace of drug development. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. Staff is very engaged. I would characterize uh, the engagement as serious, uh, as constructive. When I talk to CEOs, to business leaders around the country, mm -hmm. they tell me things are actually going very well. We're only a couple weeks away, but if you go to the timeline to pass something in the House and pass something in the Senate, 
you got to have something done by this weekend. We are nowhere near any of that. I appreciate the president slightly meaning to talk up and then days, but there is no move. Compare and contrast, Leo Brainerd there, the National Economic Council director, speaking on CBS with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy on the same issue, saying very different things about the direction of travel going into talks between the president and the House Speaker a little bit later on this afternoon, around about 3 p.m. Eastern time. Later on this morning, retail sales in America, 8.30, one hour and 13 minutes from now. We've got a flavour of what's happening in retail from Home Depot a little bit earlier. Cutting their outlook, the stock is trying to bounce. We were negative 5%. We're now negative just 3.2% in early trading, down to about 279 on that stock in the pre-market. For the broader market, we're negative 0.1% on the S&P 500. TK yields come in, fall down just a little bit by two or three basis points through the curve. Two's out to 30s. On a 10-year right now, we're down about two basis points to 347.75. Modest surveillance correction, but we always correct when we're wrong, and I was wrong. Home Depot, I'm assuming, leading over the last 10 years lows has outperformed Home Depot on a per-year share return. I would Didn't not have guessed that. There we go. That, that's a really uh, different part to the uh, mix as well. Right now in Washington, we're going to try to take a different spin here. Isaac Boltanski joins us, Director of Policy Research at BTIG. Exquisitely good on the, the distillate of when we're done with this. Isaac, first question. The morning after this is fixed, what happens we go on to fight about other things now, you know, then the morning after, then we're going to refocus on whatever the next big legislative deadline is. And that may be right. the spending bill at the end of September, maybe the farm bill. But when we get this off the table, I think the market can go back to worrying about everything else because the debt ceiling right. is so important. I look, Isaac, and, and this goes back, folks, to uh, Pete Peterson, the gentleman from Nebraska who called me up. He was quite elderly at the time. And he and I talked about his ageless concern, Isaac, where the former Secretary of Commerce made clear he was forever worried about this debt. The Peterson Foundation publishes that CBO interest expense over the next 10 years will go from $640 billion to $1.4 trillion dollars. That's the interest expense. Every American knows that's nuts. Why shouldn't we be concerned about this? We absolutely should. We absolutely should. But D.C. has an, has an inability to focus on the long term, right? We are focused definitionally on short termism. And even when we have these discussions regarding the debt ceiling and maybe spending, we've already taken off the table talks about addressing long term entitlement reform which as we know is one of the larger drivers of our debt. And so we've also taken off the table defense spending and other items. And so when you start with so many sacred cows, it's impossible to actually get anywhere over the long term. So the most we can hope for, Tom, from these negotiations is just not shooting ourselves in the foot with a technical default and having to go through the mess of prioritization and whatever else may come from not doing the basic job of lifting the debt ceiling. Isaac, I'd love you to build on what Wendy Schiller was talking about at Brown University earlier this morning when she said that in our ultra-polarized world, she expects things to uh, sort of be a repeat of 2011 in a bit, but with a less satisfying legislative uh, solution, basically saying that Republicans tend to want the government to go into some sort of default or at least some sort of non-payment because it plays well in terms of them taking a hard line on spending. Is that true or is that not really borne out in your experience? I don't think that we're there yet. And I'm still operating under the old maxim that things in D.C. are impossible right up until the point that they're inevitable. And I do hope that we're able to get some progress today where we're able to move forward on that list of menu items that we've all seen reported about over the past few days to the point where perhaps President Biden leaves his G7 meeting early or uh, skips Australia and some of the other stops, comes back, has a one on one with Kevin McCarthy as early as next week, and then at least at, and my base case here is we just have a deal that pushes the debt ceiling deadline to the end of September, which then aligns it with the federal spending deadline and gives negotiators a little bit more time because, look, they're trying to solve some pretty thorny issues when in reality, you got to have something starting to move its way through the legislative process. 
by the beginning of next week. As we wait for paint to dry and get a sense of when things get to be a little bit more urgent, we're going to have the hearings uh, with respect to what happened with Silicon Valley Bank and all of the regulatory oversight. We already got a look at some of the uh, pre-released questions from the former CEO of SVB, blaming the Fed, blaming regulators, blaming social media. What do you expect the response to be? Look, the reality is hearings very rarely change the policy trajectory, and, and we need investors to know that the regulatory framework is going to be tightened for banks. They're going to start with super regionals for, for their total long-term debt requirements and resolution requirements, and then they're going to go down to the $100 billion plus bucket and, and start to deal with things like AOCI. But, but my issue here is I don't think this banking crisis is over. I think it's going to flare up again. And what we're going to have to deal with when we look at the post-mortem for this crisis is what was the logic behind us tying the hands of the regulators on the front line to address these crises? The FDIC has nothing else it can do administratively to address this deposit insurance issue. So once again, we're waiting on a Congress that's either unwilling or unable to act on the matter. And you know, frankly, that scares me because we're not through the woods yet on the banking issue. Well, Isaac, let's tease out a little bit more of that. What about the tension in the last couple of months do you think has the potential to flare up again? Look, I think that we have not addressed the mismatch of assets and liabilities across the banking system. I think that we have not dealt with some of what I think we can all agree were supervisory failures. And we spoke earlier about the Federal Reserve's mandate. And the Federal Reserve is also going to take some flack here. There's a hearing about Federal Reserve reform later this week, worrying that perhaps their guiding star is just monetary policy, and that leads them to fall down on their job as a bank supervisor sometimes. So I think that's still out there. And and look, I, I listened to Jamie Dimon when he also says that, that he's concerned that it's not over. So I put all of that together. I put into that mix the fact that you still have some policymakers talking about the need for a short selling ban on banks. And, and I look and say that our option set for addressing another flare up, especially if it's in a bigger, um, uh, more systemically important bank, is pretty limited to just Congress passing legislation quickly. And they're not good at that. Isaac, thanks for the perspective. Isaac Botanskin, the brutal honesty there at the end from BTIG. Just on the debt ceiling, this is the closest the US government comes to behaving like European governments, and that's not a compliment. Just this idea that you need a crisis to get a solution. It seems to be the European way for a long, long time, well, specifically for the EU, that you have to get closer and closer to right. this crisis moment to get the solution you're waiting for. And, what's and by crisis, we're talking about market tension that just isn't there yet in a major way. And new to America, and the Pew Research has us out in the last number of days, they had a wonderful tweet on it, and I don't have it in front of me to do it, but the bottom line is the new polarity of America between right and left is something unique, even compared to the European nations. I noticed the polarity versus France was, was much greater. Well, we've gotten to the point where Isaac Boltanski comes out and says that requires legislation, which they'd have to pass quickly, which is something they're terrible at, which is basically a sense of the dysfunction that everyone keeps talking about in Washington <clears throat> and what ends up what? getting legislative, uh, getting legislated by some of the rank and file who work at the Fed, who work at the Treasury, who work at these departments because of an absence of legislation. Yeah. legislation and action in the Congress. I take front. real issue with the people that say this is new. I, there was a period where I woke up in my 20s and realized how dumb I was about American history, like 1880, 1890. And pre-Teddy Roosevelt, I mean, it was like this, John. It, it was it was tight battles day sure. to day, week to week in Washington. But Lisa's point, look, they sit there in their rooms, I imagine. I'm not saying this happens, just my thoughts. You get two points for passing legislation, you get three for fighting and fighting's easier. The life of a politician in Washington, D.C., right? Pretty good equation. I think that that's fair, and I think that that's what keeps on happening. I think that there is a slight shift Let's work through the market action this Tuesday morning. Good morning and welcome to the program on TV and radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Your equity market looks like this on the S&P. Negative by 0.1% on the Nasdaq, down by not even that much. We're down by 0.05% on the Nasdaq 100. <coughs> Snapping a two-day losing streak on the S&P yesterday with some marginal gains. Into the bond market, two-year, 10-year. 
30 year yields come in three basis points on a two year 397.90 basically the average of the last 30 days is a little north of four percent not too far off that the average at a 10 year in and around 350 that's where we are now 347.75 it's the bumpy road to nowhere in both the bond market and the equity market over the last month or so no to the morning goes to tony dwyer of Canaccord Genmity. Catch up with Tony in about two hours from now on Bloomberg TV. Here's the quote, Tom, and I know you've read the note as well. He's been speaking to clients and he says the following. They are hesitant to get optimistic given the macro backdrop and increasing likelihood of recession. Nervous to become overly negative given the damage that has already been done underneath the surface on the S&P 500. It's a really good note because it talks about the behavior in a collared market. We have the conflation of moving averages now down to a single point. And Dwyer says the market is fine, F-I-N-E, frustrated, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. Like sounds me. like this, you know, it sounds like <laughs> our, our staff. newsletter, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, the newsletter is called <laughs> Fine. Brew. The Fine Newsletter. Everything's fine. <laughs> Insecure, <laughs> and neurotic, it's a toxic and emotional. Brew. But, but within this, uh, oh, Mr. Boy. Dwyer really hits on a point, which is the behavioral characteristics. It's not just about comp sales at Home Depot. Home Depot. There's a lot of emotion going on here as it well. It goes back to something we've been talking about for a while. Clearly, monetary <coughs> policy is adjusted really quickly from zero just over a year ago through five and Maybe they go even further, but they're certainly declaring they are done for now, perhaps, yeah. pause and wait, but ultimately not cut. And Lisa, with that in mind, the damage done, was it last year? The price we've got to pay for it. Was it 30 percent on the Nasdaq? Is it more than that? Do we have to see unemployment go up 100 basis points? What's the time horizon for them to get back to inflation numbers of 2 percent, say? And this is the issue. You're nervous at the moment to go long. At the same time, you're a little <coughs> bit hesitant to get short. It's a really annoying market. I mean, I think that that's correct. And Stuart Kaiser put I it like well, that. which is basically, it is annoying because basically yeah. people aren't that bearish. They're looking at the market. They're seeing some positive signs, yet they don't believe that they're going to get rewarded as much as just simply going into cash yeah. and getting 5%. I, I know we got to move the show forward, but I, I think this is incredibly important. The percentage of people that participate in the recovery out of October, as Ed Yardini mentioned, and the huge number of people that aren't in the game right now and missed that recovery out of October. Two, two different annoying behaviors. Look, everyone sounds with. like that classic two-handed economist, right? <clears throat> on one hand this, yeah. on the other hand that. Look at the Bank of America fund manager survey this morning. You can see the gloom and you can see the optimism too. In the gloom, global growth expectations, worst levels of the year. In the rotation, out of commodities, <clears throat> into tech stocks. Defensive. You can see this across the board. The most crowded trades right now, long big tech, short banks. That's pessimism right there. Here's the hope. The majority of investors still hoping for a soft landing rather than a hard one. The vast majority of investors expecting the debt ceiling resolution before the X date. And a survey of participants in this survey, here we go, forecasting just a 1% drop lease in global EPS in the next 12 months. This is what's really keeping things supported and why people are getting burned out of every bearish trade that they possibly can. And you just this really raises a question about the consumer and how long that can mm. keep upholding it, which is what we saw in earnings. If you take a look at Home Depot, we've been talking about that all morning when they came out cutting the outlook, and it really is about outlooks uh, going forward, saying that sales were going to be a lot lower. Those shares have clawed back losses that at one point were almost 5%, now down just 2% as people parse through those earnings lows. It's a comparable uh, Competitor, I should say, is down 2.3 percent in sympathy. And this really raises this issue. Is this just simply a housing specific uh, kind of area or is this broader retail weakness? If you take a look at the other companies that are going to be reporting, TJ Maxx, as well as uh, Target, both tomorrow, as well as Wal uh, Walmart coming out on Thursday, all of those shares are down in sympathy, but not that much. Target seeing the biggest declines, given the fact that they've had a bit of, I don't know, should I just say volatility in their results over the past few years? Yeah, particularly Target. Yeah. Was it last May? That was just ugly. Was it last May? I think it was. Yeah, but it was like a couple. Yeah, we had a few of them. Reviews that were them. pretty, pretty I'm problematic. With you. Lisa went through the earnings from retail. This week, of course, Target tomorrow, Walmart coming up on Thursday, 8.30 Eastern time. We get retail sales for the United States, that data point for the previous month. Later on this afternoon, 3 p.m. Eastern time, Biden and House Speaker McCarthy set to meet today on the debt limit. Lindy, Lindsay Rosener of Pigeon Fixed Income weighing in on the market reaction, writing the following. There's a kink in the T-bill curve around the X date with 100 <coughs> basis points of extra yield. If we don't get a resolution, we're just kicking the can down the road and not eliminating the problem. This makes the T-bill market, Tom, right. a challenging place 
to be. Really good note from someone really qualified to talk about this. And, of course, with all the hierarchy of PGM and the excellence they've done over the years, Ms. Rosner joins us uh, right now. Lindsay, I, the note really goes to the opportunity that's out there. What is the opportunity given a discontinuous function in the three-month T-bill? How do you play it? Right. I, I think the answer is you, you don't play it. Um, there's so much talk right now about getting this extra 100 basis points. But if you think about it, the downside, if we actually do have a default, which we think happens with a 5% probability, um, 100 basis points is just not good enough upside downside analysis. So for us, it's skip the games in the front end of the curve and get more into the intermediate duration space where you can take advantage of well, doing the right kind of things. I mean, what's so important here, Lindsay, and this is to the elasticity or responsiveness of the belly of the curve five to seven years, I'll call it as well. Then what's the opportunity there? How do you play that? I think there are a lot of opportunities and, and you can go kind of any which way you want. So if you want to be more conservative, you want to stay more investment grade, great opportunities in agency mortgage backed securities, even commercial mortgage backed securities, if you stay high quality, um, top of the cap structure, triple A's with a lot of credit enhancement, there's good stuff to do in investment grade space, a lot of opportunity there. But if you want to seek more risk, go for more yields, there are idiosyncratic opportunities in high yield. So you've got kind of a diner menu of options in the middle of the curve, and you don't have to get stuck in this noise or the anxiety that you all were speaking of in the very front end of the curve. That is really hard to play. And the big problem is, is that if the debt ceiling, if, if the quick solution is prioritization, that's just kicking the problem a couple, a month, two months down the road, you're going to be right back in it. And so if you thought you did something cute and you bought T-bills two months out, well, you may now be back at the X state before you know it. And it's just not a game worth playing. Okay. That said, if this, let's say, gets resolved, do you then get more risk on? Do you start to get more aggressive in other areas that go beyond just simply the idiosyncratic trades? So we go back to, uh, with your prior catch, you're asking, okay, this gets resolved, what's next? And, and the what's next is we go back to what we were concerned about, which is we still have the central banks across the globe that are trying to fight inflation. And there are parts of the globe where we still have double digit inflation. So this battle isn't over. And we need to think about how does the curve respond. Right now, we all know that there's a significant amount of cuts priced in in the US, for example, at the end of the year. How does that work out moving forward? And so we go back to inflation watch. We get out of debt ceiling watch and we move back to inflation watch and figuring out, is a recession happening? Will it be a soft landing? And in that scenario, it still isn't yet green light risk on. We've been talking about that Bank of America fund manager survey, and one aspect of it was that allocations to bonds are the biggest going back to 2009. This is the latest one uh, from May. How much does that give you a sense that things are crowded in the duration trade? Basically, this idea that longer term, there is a confidence that we're going to be low inflation, low rate kind of, uh, you know, trading the same way that we were over the past few decades. I think what we've got here are some big shifts in asset allocation or portfolio allocation. Forever, there was the discussion of the 60-40. 60-40 is not really working. Um, if you have a move to this 50-50 or even more fixed income, that then tells you that these flows make sense and they are stickier than, than one may think. Also, as we've been saying all year, you've got income and fixed income. This isn't a place that you just park it because you're scared. There's a lot to earn here. And so I think that movement into fixed income is well-founded. I'm obviously biased as a fixed income manager, but I think it makes a lot of sense now and it didn't make much sense for a very long time. Do you think the allocations are just generally increasing in a structural manner to fixed income and decreasing to equities so that it might be more of a 50-50 kind of new portfolio? I, I think time will tell. Um, I do think it's moving in that direction and I think that direction makes a lot of sense. Lindsay. Got to wrap it up there. <clears throat> Always enjoy your insight, particularly on the debt ceiling. You know, for once, we're actually having some intelligent conversations, Tom, on the debt ceiling this morning. Wendy Schiller offering her view, her opinion. Lindsay Rosner there on the bond market. Yeah, no, I, I think we're, I think everybody in the media is struggling with this, and some go from the emotion of, you know, oh, he put his elbow down on the edge of the oval couch. What's it mean? No, we're going to try to talk to real too. people about this, including try not to CBO. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, you know, but, but the, you know, we're going to fold in the work of CBO and the industry in Washington that's got a real long term concern about this. It's like we've been crying wolf on this for how many years? Someday the wolf's going to show up. 
I'm with you. Period. But right now, that's not the view, is it? The consensus no, view is that, that is not it the view. gets no. dealt with. And I know that you share that view deep down. And the R start is lower and things are wonderful and it's morning in America. Talks again, 3 p.m. Eastern time, a little bit later on this afternoon. Home Depot recovering a bit here, Tom. We're down 2.4% yeah. <clears throat> in the pre-market. And this is unusual. I, mean, I want to sell this and I want to be sure it's more important at 9 o'clock to listen to John Farrell on Bloomberg Television than to be on the HD call. But the sell side is saying this call really matters, not only for Home Depot, but the tune of it. And uh, Steve Zaccone over at Citigroup just says, you know, the language that these guys use in pressure when they're writing, I love this, updated quarterly margin cadence. What does that mean? I have no idea what that means. we got to get Zaccone on uh, to talk about it. But that's the kind of language you're seeing here at 7.40 a.m. into an important 9 a.m. conference call. Lisa mentions TJ Maxx. I mean, I'm looking at the Buffon and Broken Heart, Glam (laughs) Cheetah, Outdoor Water Resistant, Picnic Beach Blanket. Well, we were Mm. talking earlier today, though, uh, about margins and how long can margins continue to actually expand. We saw the first margin expansion on net from S&P 500 companies that have reported going back a year and a half. How long can that continue if if consumers really are pushing back? So then all of a sudden you have to think from a corporate perspective, things perhaps look less good and some of the celebratory uh, shifts that we've seen in the stock prices might not be as warranted. I mean, this is sort of one of the bearish calls. Next stop for this conversation, 8.30 Eastern time for U.S. retail sales. Now, imagine you yep. run a bank and you're running that bank and, and you rely on one thing, not your team around you, but Fed speak. <laughs> Fed speak is literally the thing that you rely on. The whole model. It's just like whatever they say, whatever Powell said, he says it's transitory. That, that means I'm going to build my Coast. business around it being yeah, yeah, yeah. transitory and, <clears throat> and low rates forever. And they're not going to ever raise rates. And so mm. they don't have to hedge duration. And that's going to be the CEO's argument from How SPB. did that work out? David George of Bed on the banking sector. Great voice over the last month or so on this topic. The stress of the last couple of months in regional banks is coming up shortly. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The White House and congressional leaders head into another session of debt limit talks today to try and avoid a default. President Biden has says he was optimistic a deal could be reached, while House Speaker Kevin McCarthy expressed that ongoing discussions were not productive at all and leaders are nowhere near reaching an agreement. The former CEO of Silicon Valley Bank says the Fed and social media contributed to the lender's collapse. Greg Becker testifies before the Senate Banking Committee today. He's expected to blame the fastest pace of hikes by the Fed in decades. According to his prepared remarks, Becker also will point a finger at negative social media sentiment. A special counsel faulted the FBI and Justice Department's probe into whether Donald Trump's campaign conspired with Russia in the 2016 election. Still, John Durham failed to issue any new charges or recommend significant changes to investigative procedures. The former president had claimed that Durham would reveal a conspiracy to undercut his presidency. Global oil demand will rise more than expected this year because of China's post-pandemic rebound. That's according to the International Energy Agency. The IEA says world fuel consumption will rise by 2.2 million barrels a day to a record 102 million. The agency expects demand in China to hit an all-time high. And a group of senior officials from Tesla are visiting India this week, looking to expand its supply chain beyond China. The visit would represent a thaw in the relationship. Tesla CEO Elon Musk has criticized India's high import taxes and its electric vehicle policies. India has advised Tesla not to sell cars in the country that have been made in China, its political adversary. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. We at the Federal Reserve probably have more work to do on our end to try to bring inflation back down. And most importantly, we should not be fooled by a few months of positive data. You know, we still are well in excess of our 2% inflation target, and we need to finish the job. Neil Kashkari, pretty consistent on the issue around inflation over the last few months. The Minneapolis Fed president weighing in tons of Fed speak this week. I've gone through the names already. I won't do that again to you, but it concludes with Chairman Powell at the end of this week. For the broader market, we are negative 0.16% on the S&P 500. Just a little bit softer to start your morning, a bit defensive, captured by that move in yields lower 
on a 10-year, 347.75. Home Depot recovering just a little bit. It was down 5%. We've cut those losses in half. We're down 2.4% right now on Home Depot. Retail sales in America, Tom, just around the corner. Let's say 43 minutes away. <clears throat> retail sales will be important. I'll be looking at Control Group, which really breaks it down. Jen, I really want to emphasize there's like seven retail sales reports that come out at once. And I do take the distillate out building products, out gas, out this, out that. And it's the Control Group. It'll be interesting to see what that metric is. And that is. read gets plugged into GDP, Tom. <clears throat> When we get a few more reads, if, of if that McKee says it does, it does. I don't. I can't get there, but McKee says it does that, right? And there's productivity, yep. uh, as well. Futures. Can we say that the tape is recovered from the Home Depot shock? I think you know it's a little bit recovered. Yeah, we've bounced off yeah. the lows, Tom, and we'll see what we get on the call, and then we'll see what we get from Target, from Walmart, and the yeah. overall figure a little bit later at 8.30 Eastern. We'll see what we see. In banking, we will see what we see forward with not only the financial statistics and all the studies Lisa's reading in the afternoon when they slip out, but also what the executives of the failed banks say. David George joins us now, senior research analyst at Barron. David, I'm going to break a rule. I'm not going to go to four accounting statements. I want to go not so much to the behavior, but the verbiage that we're getting from failed bankers. To me, I've made this very clear on air. They were basically marketing experiments wrapped around the gauze and protection of your banking system. Are you put back by the comments we're hearing? It's the Fed's fault. It's the San Francisco Fed's fault, et cetera. Yeah, it's, it's hard to, Tom, and good morning. Thanks for having me. It, it's hard to buy into that commentary with a lot of weight, at least from my perspective. And it's easy for me to say from the cheap seats on the, on the sell side here, but um, clearly uh, bank management teams, CEOs, CFOs, Treasury departments are paid millions of dollars to manage risk for shareholders, for their customers, right. for their various constituents, et cetera. So um, I think that's a, a kind of a soft excuse from my perspective. I'm going to go to Nassim Taleb where he says all that matters is skin in the game. Once again, and this goes back to Frank Quattrone 101 from a million years ago, David George, these guys were compensated off growthiness up the income statement at the revenue line, for example, rather than growthiness of profit. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. And we don't cover Silicon Valley, to, to be clear. But it, it, the what one common denominator, Tom, of all of these banks that have failed is that they have grown very quickly. Banking is not um, a growth business. It just isn't. So it, it is going to grow typically at a GDP rate, maybe plus 100 to 200 basis points. And all of one common denominator of these failed banks is they grew very quickly. And there's some regulatory oversight issues that I think probably need to be addressed. But in particular, the deposit funding mechanisms for these companies, a very chunky deposit base, which poses a lot of risk when, um, when, when there's fear in the system. And I think that was also another common theme of the banks that have, uh, have failed. Is it over? I think we're pretty close, Lisa. Um, again, it, 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 fr from my vantage point, we don't cover PacWest or Wall. Those are obviously ones that, that if we turn on your station and, and others, that, that, get, that gets a lot of publicity. It appears that the liquidity uh, situation in the system is pretty good. And from my perspective, if you haven't changed banks by now, you're probably not going to. And um, so we're of the view that the vast majority of the deposit movement is behind us. The results and updates that we've gotten Lisa, so far here in the second quarter from many of the kind of more established regional banks has actually been pretty good. So uh, as cooler heads prevail through the balance of uh, 2023, we actually feel pretty good about where we are. And we, we think we're in the, the later stages of, uh, of this episode of whatever you want to call it. Which gets to the sort of existential question of what this crisis or whatever you want to call it has been. Is this really an issue of deposits leaving the system or is this an issue of profitability when you have to pay up for those deposits? Now, I was reading this Georgetown professor's comments who is saying the biggest problem is confidence, and I am not sure how you build that back. It is not going to just be deposit insurance. So how far away are we from building that confidence that not only can you put your money there, but you can get your money, uh, you can get good interest, and, oh, yeah, this company is actually going to deliver returns? Yeah, I think what, what's happened in the last six to eight weeks is what we would have expected, Lisa, to occur over the next six to eight quarters. I think it's very important to have a, an intermediate to longer term context about bank deposits and liquidity. If you were to take a look at bank deposits or demand deposits or checking accounts as a percentage of total funding over the last 50 years, it's around 25 to 30 percent. And the response from COVID, both fiscal and monetary, resulted in 
significant overages of deposits. And that number got up to 40%. So as a, and we view this sector through a normalized lens. I think you have to do that as it relates to credit, liquidity, margins, et cetera. And all we're seeing is just a normalization of, of liquidity. And the bank deposits are not going to zero. They're over $17 trillion, and companies have significant operating right. accounts that are going to stay in the banking system. So that's something that's just happened a little quicker. And uh, profitability, we think, is going to get much better over the next six to eight quarters as banks can reprice those assets yeah. upward. David, Robert W. Baird is Milwaukee, First Wisconsin, and all the rest of the heritage of Milwaukee finance and investment. I'm absolutely fascinated by within all your connections within Baird and across Wisconsin, is there an urge to merge among bankers or are they just too comfortable with the status quo? Well, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. We're of the view <clears throat> over time that you're going to get more deals. And I think a lot of bank management teams are sitting here today thinking about the future, thinking about this episode and, and the risks that that, uh, that emanate from uh, from what we've lived through over the last couple of months. So we're, we're of the view. And I think um, uh, Janet Yellen has expressed a, a more of an openness to, to deal. So it wouldn't surprise us to see some MOEs or some some larger bank deals over the next couple of years. I think we need to get some clarity, Tom, as it relates to credit. Uh, but clearly, the, the I think the secular trend uh, for more M and A is is clearly in front of us for sure. David, I just want to put a bow on something. It's how you started this conversation. Do you think people are continuing to overstate just how flighty deposits are? Do you still think the deposit base at most banks is still really really sticky? Has it changed so much with the proliferation of in internet banking over the last 10 years or so? Yeah, I think it is pretty sticky. And and um, it, it, it is not as sticky as it was maybe 30 years ago. But at the end of the day, it's important, particularly for small and medium sized companies, commercial banks and regional banks in particular, um, are the lifeblood, John, of their of their cap of the basically the capital system and 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 provide significant liquidity, payroll, cash management, treasury management <clears throat> services to all of these companies, and they provide a, a meaningful and valuable service that that I believe they should be paid for and they will be paid for over time. So um, it is a relationship business, particularly on the corporate side, and I think that's something to remember. Whereas I think Silicon Valley, Signature, some of the others are maybe a little bit more transactional, and yeah. that's where you have a little bit more risk. David, thank you, sir, for your perspective. David George of Baird, just a sensible voice on a difficult conversation. Just on the deposit base, I get that some things have changed. I think we all understand that in the last 10 years. Internet banking is a much bigger thing. The ease of opening an account, yeah, understand yeah. all of that. SVB is a really bad example of it. If you have more than 90% of your deposits uninsured, by definition, they are massive in size. Not a real bank. If you see loads of money go out of the door really quickly, how many hands full of money are you seeing run out of the door really quickly? You're just seeing a few big customers go out of the door. It's not a bank. I, I well, mean, I we get can in have trouble that debate. I'm get, it's <laughs> we can have that debate another time. I, I, it's, it's a, a very different concept. bank, TK. It's a very yeah. different financial institution. I have a tattoo here. I like to put it. Over here, I got Lula from Brazil because I was so wrong on Lula. Right under here, it says, and a banker told me this years ago, and I was incredibly wrong on the fold-up of the small banks. Tom, I like to go to lunch. And that's what the guy said. And so much of the lack of mergers in Gerard Cassidy and David George's world is literally people like to get up in the morning with their board, their golf buddies, their rotary members and that, and they like to go to lunch or maybe a breakfast before it. It's a hugely behavioral thing across America. I'm not sure how many lunches have been had. I don't think in, it's in the same in England. Over, over is this the, the same in England? <laughs> is, is it the same in England where there's that lots and lots be, of little banks? It used to be that way, Tom. And it's gone. They're going to lunch. They're playing golf. Small, small banks all over, dotted all over the, England. The branches they're have gone. all been shut down. All the branches have been yeah. closed down. We're still living it. I know. About 20 years behind. I've said that repeatedly. Yeah, or, U or U.S. More. banking yeah. behind Europe, particularly the Scandinavian countries, where they're basically cashless societies. Some of those countries are now. Anyway, that's a different topic. On the S&P 500, negative 0.1 percent. Retail sales, 34 minutes away. I'm leaning towards the bond market view that we're in for some volatility. We're kind of bouncing into 
a ceiling at a floor, effectively. We think the market's a little bit generous in terms of Fed cuts coming. The Fed has done a very good job of continuing to support the economy while raising rates and trying to tame inflation. I'm in the camp that it's not going to go neatly back to 2%. I think there's another upside surprise waiting out there in the inflation data. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television. A Tuesday of retail sales in this hour and the productivity of America. John, retail sales front and center after Home Depot. Oh, without a doubt. Home Depot a little bit lighter, soft and negative in the pre-market. But phrase of the morning so far from Chuck Grump of Gordon Haskett. Discretionary recession is his call, Tom, going into retail sales later this morning onto Target tomorrow, Walmart after that. And the mystery and the character of recession, we're still modeling numbers. I think of Lindsay Piegza the other day, the idea of 2% real GDP. That's not what we see here. January booming, February, I don't know. But into March and April, there seems to be a real mystery about state of the consumer. Captured by the rotation in the equity market and the outperformance <clears throat> of tech so far year to date. The Bank of America fund manager survey out earlier this morning. Tom, we talked about it a few times. Top two crowded trades right now. Long tech, short banks. Yeah. That's been the rotation away from the commodity cyclical stories towards, say, the big tech names. That Tony, growth story again. Tony Dwyer with John Farrow on the 9 o'clock hour. That's important uh, as well. Lisa, I want to get to this quickly because we've got a fabulous guest for Global Wall Street to get us started in this 8 o'clock hour. But Lisa, I look at all of this and it's almost a joy in that the debt ceiling debate drifts aside. We had slower data in China, slower data from Home Depot, and there's sort of a stew within the collar trade we're in right now. And a slower sense in Germany, too, that idea I miss that, that we saw that ZWE, uh, ZW, <clears throat> ZEW survey that came out earlier that shows suddenly people are much more concerned with an actual negative read on this key gauge. How much are we looking at that really being a China story, a recovery that wasn't as strong as people thought, filtering into... The strength that everybody thought was just shockingly surprising that now seems to be fading on the margins. It's not just that, is it? It's factory orders in the last few weeks. Go back to the numbers we had from Maersk, big shipping company, saying things weren't great. Miss Lav Mateka at JP Morgan over the last few weeks has been asking the question, when is it time to drop that overweight Europe story? The time is now, according to them, in the past week or so. <coughs> the activity upswing seen around the turn of the year, which was helped by the falling gas prices in Europe, by China reopening. Tom, unlikely to transition into an acceleration into the second half. Now, the problem a lot of people are going to have with this take, if we've been talking about this now for six to nine months... The weakness is here, the weakness is here, and we keep pushing out. <laughs> yeah, these but calls we're pushing on the out, but then there's a Home Depot just as one proxy. Sure, I'm with you. But now it's finally here. And, you know, again, I really want to emphasize sell side saying this call at 9 a.m. hour in Home Depot uh, will be important for uh, the street. I don't know where I'm going to begin with the VIX because Dean Kerner told me to, John. The VIX 17.49. He could care less until we get the gloom of a 20 VIX. We'll get to Dean in just a moment. Your equity market calm as well, down by 0.13% <clears> on the SP. Tom yields down just a basis point on a 10 year, 348.69. Dean Kerner joins us now. Macro Risk Advisors, his first appearance since the pandemic began 10 years ago. We're thrilled he could join us right now. And, and Dean, with all sorts of accolades and derivatives work, particularly out of University of Chicago uh, ages ago, you go right to the dynamics of variance where there's a microeconomics to it, a supply and demand. And you say, you equate it to after Brexit, where there was a su supply strike on volatility. Take that complexity and translate it into where we are right now. Yeah, Tom, you mentioned, you mentioned the word variance. And right now in markets, there's actually very little variance, at least on a day-to-day -day basis. If you look at one month <clears throat> realized volatility in the S&P, it's in the 25th percentile. So we're in this range <clears throat> bound. You mentioned the word collar. Uh, we're just chopping within a range. And without large enough swings, it's very difficult to justify a VIX much higher than it is now. We, the realized volatility is on the order of 12. I like to call that the earnings engine of long volatility. And that engine right now is sputtering, even as on a forward-looking basis, there's so much uncertainty with respect to the debt ceiling. And you mentioned Brexit. As I think back to that period, in the months preceding June 24th of 2016, options on the British pound got incredibly expensive. And the reason they got so expensive was not because British pound volatility was extremely high. It's because there was a dearth of supply. The folks that would typically sell these <coughs> options, I think, were being tapped on the shoulder by their internal risk police saying, listen, do not be short. 
volatility on the British pound at any price. And as I think about that as an analog for what might be to come with respect to the debt ceiling, you see a similar setup, at least potentially, where the sell side trader who is asked to sell downside puts in the S&P is told by his internal uh, risk monitors, don't sell it. And so without that supply, you could see a jump higher in implied volatility in a hurry. So two things. I can't believe it's almost seven years since Brexit. I can't believe that. Time has gone so, so quickly. And I can't believe how much people ignored it after about 12 months. Right. On the morning, it felt so big. Do you remember? It felt like such a big issue. Stunning. Then really quickly, it became a European <clears throat> story and then just a local one for the next five, six, I, I, I seven years. I have the years. clearest memory of you working an 18-hour day and I was trying to find a restaurant in Mayfair and the streets were in shock. I have a clearest, clearest memory of you memory doing just that, that too. Uh, Dean, the second point, the memories of 2011. Let's go there. Yeah. What are the lessons and what are you advocating for them with clients right now going into what could be a mess and what might not be a mess? Yeah, there's the old saying, those who don't remember history are doomed to repeat it. So we try to look to the past to learn. Um, we always do that with some sense of um, there's always some contamination in terms of what we're trying to isolate. And so if you remember back in 2011, there was the Eurozone crisis that was really beginning to flare up at the same time, August, September of 2011. So we have to realize we can't fully disentangle the massive moves in the S&P 500, the spike in the VIX to 45, because there was the Eurozone flare up at the same time. There was a big growth shortfall uh, in the U.S. at the same time. However, um, we should look at it uh, anyway. And, you know, I was coming here this morning uh, and I just decided to go on YouTube and I said, Tim Geithner, 2011 debt ceiling. And so I watched Tim Geithner um, come on camera and talk about um, the impending disaster. The U.S. doesn't default. And I just said to myself, this is the exact same um, phrasing that we are seeing now. It's just a different person. Uh, Chuck Schumer was actually standing behind Tim Geithner. He's still there, <laughs> right? So we've got a different cast of characters. Chuck but it's, Schumer was standing behind Eisenhower in yeah, exactly, 1953. Right. It's just the same message. And I think what's dangerous, and it's been said before, is that um, it just it's going to take some flare-up in market prices to motivate this negotiation. And with the VIX of 17 and a half, you're just not seeing that flare-up. We haven't gotten to the point where people are getting actually nervous, and each side is sort of motivated uh, to be the aggressor in terms of trying to get a, a better deal on this thing. So we've got the obvious places to spot tension, the at-risk, so-called at-risk maturities. Where would you expect to see it beyond that and perhaps imminently? Yeah, I love gold. I, I think gold is a really interesting asset. Again, going back to 2011, you saw gold absolutely spike on both a spot basis um, there's a gold VIX. There's kind of a VIX for everything. Um, and so the gold VIX went from 17 to 40 during that period. I think there's a real good case to be made for, uh, for gold because um, it's got this concept of limited supply. Um, and um, I, I think from a Pavlovian standpoint, people are going to look to that um, to position in terms of just expressing a view that this is pretty dysfunctional stuff uh, from the U.S. Is there a sense that the CBOE uh, benchmark VIX index is pretty much dead as an indicator of true volatility implied? I don't think so. I think it's a, it's a calculation engine. Um, it became very muted last year. So S&P goes up, VIX only goes down a little bit. S&P goes down a lot, VIX only goes up a little bit. So I think that's how why people would characterize it that way. Um, it's just taking in market prices. It's actually started to normalize in terms of its relationship to the S&P or its inverse relationship. It's been more reactive, actually, right at the failure of SVB. On March 9th, the VIX beta to the S&P, or its negative beta, uh, started to rise to a level that's consistent with history. 2022 was a bit of an anomaly for a number of, for a number of reasons, but it is actually starting to be more reactive. And if you look at June open interest in VIX options, it's extraordinarily high. So people are very positioned uh, via VIX options for some you know, flare up through the debt ceiling. Just real quick here, we were talking about positioning with people hiding in cash, hiding in gold, being conservative, even though there kind of is this bifurcated risk. Is this supportive of valuations? Is this actually showing the risk to an upside, to a lack of some sort of catastrophic outcome as being more potentially painful for markets? I mean, I think my own career in markets has just led me to the conclusion that <clears throat> markets are never say never. You just really can't know what's going to happen. Um, I think about how do you stay long through this? Because 
they probably will figure it out, right? That there hasn't been a default yet. And so maybe <clears throat> markets get a big upswing. And so what do you try to do? You try to mm -hmm. stay long in an efficient way. There's opportunities to use instruments like upside calls, out of the money calls in the S&P uh, have cheapened remarkably since the beginning of the year. On a premium basis, they're down 70% from the end of last year to now. I think that's a great placeholder to stay long risk and to be able to walk away. I like to say the renter, which is what you do through options, you're renting the market, you don't pay for the plumbing problem. And so there's a potential plum plumbing problem for the United States of America, at least fiscally. Um, and so the option allows you to pay the premium. And if things do go awry, you walk away. I think that premium is actually quite cheap right now. I will never forget, Dean, what you said in the middle of 2021, when you said that transitory was the new subprime is contained. And I remember hearing that at the time and thinking, wow, that's pretty powerful. And it was right. It was dead on. Hey, Dean, thank you, for, sir. Thank you very much. Dean Kernett there at Macro Risk Advisors. Just distracted by this message I just received from uh, someone listening. Best thing I ever did was ignore the Brexit debate back then. What a waste of time. <laughs> well, yeah. I think thank you for just, for, just, just for the record, that's a, a US-based <clears throat> listener, TK, on the Brexit debate of the last seven years. I, I think we'll know in five, ten years or whatever, but you know, people that I, I listen to of all persuasions in the United Kingdom say there's some export-import dynamics here that have changed. I mean, it's all there is to Yeah, and perhaps some labour supply dynamics as well <clears throat> yeah. that we need to discuss in our future too. 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time, 20 minutes away. Tiffany Wilding and Pimco on U.S. retail sales. Looking forward to that conversation. Going into it, equities just a bit softer, negative 0.2% on the S&P. Home Depot trying to recover, down almost 3% in early trading following a cut to its outlook. More retail earnings still to come through the week. Keeping you up to date with the news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. President Biden meets with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and other congressional leaders again today to try to avert a default. McCarthy says the two sides are nowhere near a deal to raise the debt limit. The standoff has been roiling markets as investors bet whether an agreement can be reached. There's a sign that economic uncertainty is now leading to a pullback in home improvement spending. Home Depot cut its outlook for the first year for after first quarter sales dropped more than expected. Comparable sales were down 4.5 percent the first three months. The company says earnings could fall as much as 13 percent this year. Airline reservations are pointing to strong demand this summer. According to the International Airport Transportation Association, bookings for the May to September period are 35 percent higher than a year ago. Asia Pacific experienced the largest jump with a 135% increase. Ukraine says its air defense system defeated what it called an exceptional Russian missile blitz overnight. The attacks included six hypersonic missiles that were aimed at the capital city, Kyiv. Ukraine says it destroyed 18 Russian missiles. It's another sign that former Vice President Mike Pence is preparing to run for the Republican nomination for president. Pence's allies have formed a political action committee to support him. Pence said he'll announce before late June whether he will challenge his former boss, Donald Trump. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. Chinese uh, recovery has been faster and stronger than expected. Indian demand is also very robust and we're seeing very strong growth also in the Middle East. And this is contrasting with the sort of the uh, economic gloom and the concerns that we're seeing for the world economy from industrial activity uh, and especially in, in the OECD where demand has been relatively weak. It's really difficult to reconcile those comments from Toro Bosoni there, the IEA head of oil, with what we saw in the data overnight from China, which looked much weaker than expected. And they're talking about oil demand specifically being better <clears> than expected. We'll come back to that in a moment. Crude at the moment, looking at crude this morning on both WTI and on Brent, on the international contract on Brent crude. We had back to 75.35 on the day, just about positive. Likewise on WTI, $71 a barrel. The latest on the, the SPR, Tom. You seen this? Jen Jacobs, I've Bloomberg, leading the reporting. This is here. like the debt ceiling. 
Here's the quote. The US is preparing to buy up to 3 million barrels of sour crude oil to begin refilling its depleted strategic petroleum reserve, according to people familiar with the matter. Of course, they sold 200 million barrels from the emergency stockpile last year. So, like, Does, 3 million is a start, but it's kind of, you know... And in a dumb yeah. question. Yeah. Does, like, you know, to pick on the United Kingdom, but does Germany have a strategic petroleum reserve? Um, that's picking on like Germany, but I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the answer I, I, to that. So I'm, I'm just no. baffled I'm by... I'm sure our next guest does. Thing. Yeah, well, I'm going to give the guest, but I want to mention on China's slowdown, what really intrigued me was one line item was the property. In China, property really matters, and it really came in light. It was minus 5.8% down to minus 6.2%. And it's just one statistic. It's one little, you know, tea leaf there, but there it is. Youth unemployment, too, I think, got yeah. people's attention. I'm not sure how much of an accurate read you can get on that in the world's second I largest agree. economy. But, I agree. But it got people's attention overnight. He, he has been with us not nearly enough recently. Will Kennedy drives all of our hydrocarbon work. He's senior executive editor for Energy and Commodities, and it is wonderful to catch up with Mr. Kennedy at Queen Victoria Street. Uh, Will, I'm going to cut to the chase. The Bloomberg Commodity Index is not pretty. We had a pandemic boom. Up we went, and we have rolled over. Can we establish a bear market in commodities in general? Well, it seems like the, we're pretty close, Tom, and I think the reason is the one that you've alluded to is that a lot of the data uh, is from China is, is very weak. And what we're seeing is clearly a Chinese industrial economy, uh, which is not demanding commodities like people expected it to. When you look at things like the price of base metals, when you look at things like the price of iron ore in particular, uh, that demand isn't there. And the industrial recovery um, seem, it seems pretty weak, and that's partly because they're not building property, right. like you mentioned a moment ago. Um, but it does seem to be a slightly different picture in oil demand, and that, that does appear to be a slightly hard thing to reconcile. Well, folks, on radio and television, Will Kennedy has the most romantic job at Bloomberg, jetting around the world, running our hydrocarbon team. The romance of it is you're in Singapore, Will, exhausted. Tell us about the Singapore dynamic right now. Obviously, oil through the strait there and up the Pacific Rim, but far more all of the back and forth between Australia and China. What's happening in Southeast Asia? Well, I mean, there is a lot of oil heading through the, the Straits of Singapore, the Straits of Malacca, that trade in oil all the way from Russia uh, around Africa, across the Indian Ocean, up into Asia. It's happening, and China and India are buying a huge amount of oil, as the IEA said, and they're upping their uh, forecast for oil demand. And I think what that tells you is another story about perhaps about the two-speed Chinese economy, that the industrial economy is really struggling, but clearly you've got hundreds of millions of people who are flying again, driving again, and that has clearly boosted demand. There's been some weakness in diesel, again, the industrial aspect, but when we look at gasoline and jet fuel, that demand has been there, and there does seem a little bit of a mismatch between the demand figures that the IEA is saying, that they expect oil demand to reach a record all-time high of 102 million barrels this year, and what people are pricing. Uh, we've had this very weak market for the rest of the year. So uh, what you're seeing on the ground in Asia isn't quite at the moment gelling with what we're seeing in uh, financially traded oil contracts. How do you explain this, Will? Because we've heard this consistently for a couple months now, that basically oil markets are not trading in tandem with fundamentals that really suggest a much tighter market. I mean, I think it must be come down to a couple of things. One, people are trading the future here. It reflects people's anxiety about how the global economy uh, develops from here in the second half of the year. Um, it also ref sort of reflects supply. I mean, we're all very focused on demand all the time. But I think it's well worth telling people, saying that supply is running ahead of what people expected, and particularly out of Russia. Our weekly tracking of Russian exports uh, saw it as high as it had been in some time, 10 percent higher than, it, than a couple of months ago. And that's not what people expected to see, because Russia had pledged to cut back production. It claims it's doing it, but we're not seeing that in export numbers. There's oil coming out of Iran. There's oil coming out of Venezuela, and I think that there's plenty of oil around meeting an uncertain demand picture. So for all the focus on demand, let's talk about supply. So uh, if you put those two things together, uh, that's one reason why we, <coughs> the things have been displayed. And, and then there's the sort of, I, I think, the way that uh, people have traded uh, oil, which is to use it as an inflation hedge up. Uh, and now that people are less worried about inflation, they may be getting out of that trade. 
Well, I do wonder, to the point that John and Tom were talking about, the fact that the U.S. may be refilling the Strategic Petroleum Reserve as soon as uh, August, not refilling it exactly, perhaps putting a drop in the bucket mm. with respect to how much they plan to buy, but how much is that potentially going to influence the market, given how much people thought that it did on the other way when they were buying suppressing prices? Look, I think it's important that the U.S. has taken that step. I think people are waiting to see that it happened. And yes, it's only three million barrels. It's not a huge amount, but it's definitely something people have been looking to happen. And there's been talk about uh, them from administration's officials doing more uh, uh, later this year, early next year. Uh, it's going to take a long time, uh, and I don't think they're going to rush or feel the need to refill everything right. they've sold. I, I think they're going to take a view on how big it is. Um, but I think it's important, and it's definitely something that traders are going to factor into their, into their thinking when they think about uh, the downside uh, for oil and how low it could go, because clearly you've got a buyer willing to come into the market uh, when oil gets cheap. Well, very quickly here, is it beneficial for you and the team to watch the dynamics of iron ore right now? Do you glean a lot of information from that? I think the iron ore market is probably telling us something important about this, the state of the Chinese economy. And as the Chinese data on the industrial side comes in pretty weak, and it does seem to be coming in weak, I think you would say that the iron ore market has been telling you that for some time because it's been on a down, down roll, downward move for a number of months. And clearly it is sending a signal about how busy steel mills are in China and uh, the demand for steel from sectors like construction. Brent Crude, 75, WTI, 71. Will Kennedy, thank you, sir, <coughs> of Bloomberg on the latest effort around crude, what's happening with Chinese data and what we're hearing from the IEA as well. What you hear on Bloomberg TV in about 35 minutes from now, coming up on the open on Bloomberg, Mohammed al Arin oh, in studio of Bloomberg he's Opinion. With us. He's, Looking he's, forward to that. Cassie Barrow of yeah. J.P. Morgan. Gershon Deston fan of Alliance Bernstein. Oh, Tony Dwyer oh. of Canical Genesis. It's quite a lineup this morning, it's isn't it? It's great. Yeah, it's good. Some yeah. all-stars. Tony's fired up. Tony is fired up. It's great Al-Arin, you know, and I've got to give you credit, John. I wish we had relegation in American sports. Right now is a prime season where these three teams down at the bottom of English football are going, oops. And I love this story. Folks, this is what it's about. He's 21 years old. He's from Nigeria and Ireland. And Mr. Bazunu, three, a cup of coffee ago, somebody paid 420000 whatever for him. And three years later, it was $12 million. I mean, the kid was like 16 at 400000 And then he was $12 million to, I think, Southampton at some time. And now the tots are looking at him. So Spurs won this keeper. Yeah I, yeah, I guess so. But this is only happening because of relegation, right? Because Southampton have been relegated to, to the, the league below. The league below, and what happens is you have to sell some of your crown jewels because you can't afford them anymore, and you've got to try and retain I, a core of a team to try and get promoted again. And it's very difficult to get promoted. It's really, really difficult. I, I just love this, and I, I, I think it's you know it's like the changes in the rules in baseball. These are revolutionary things, and. This kid, Bazuno, I just think it's just a perfect example of what could happen. You know in what? American I thought sports. what Ryan Reynolds did with Wrexham, it was just the awesome, yeah. just fantastic. If you haven't watched that. They went up a league this year? Yeah, they have. They got yeah. promoted. And we'll see if they can do the same again. Just awesome. Did I do okay there in my that soccer was great. talk? Well done, TK. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, Future's a bit an softer. Hour of study. Retail sales coming up next. Signposts on the way to retail sales. Bloomberg surveillance, Lisa Bramlett and Tom Keen. John Farrell preparing uh, for the next hour. Futures at negative seven. The two-year yield, 4.01%. Uh, as well, the 10-year yield, 3.49%. Uh, that ought to about do it for the pulse of America as we look at productivity and critically the many series of retail sales. That can mean only one thing. Michael McKee will join us as the data comes out here. Michael, how is the consumer doing? Uh, it looks like the consumer is hanging in there. We got a little bit stronger than anticipated growth uh, in the uh, control group, which is uh, what feeds into GDP, up seven tenths of a percent. The forecast was for a rise of four tenths, and it had contracted three tenths the month before. Uh, same story with auto, uh, with uh, the overall headline number up four tenths. Uh, one percent last uh, time, so not quite as strong there. Uh, but the uh, X transportation is up four tenths. That was a negative eight tenths last time. So it does look like the uh, consumer is hanging in there, which is what uh, the uh, 
Fed was kind of hoping to see if you're going to do the uh, soft landing scenario, you need the consumer to hang in there. Uh, and uh, so far they are. Uh, I'll let you get this, the market reaction. I'll see what I can find sure. out here about uh, what went up and what went down. And Lisa, the market reaction is higher yields, and I would suggest it's pretty dramatic over the last two, three, four days. The set of data has got us out on the two-year thermometer to 4.04%. Uh, so there, there's a tangible lift here in yields, higher yields. Bill note, bond prices <laughs> lower as well. And again, equities, like Dean Kern had said, somnolent, that would be the fancy word for it. Well, I'm looking right now a little bit better than <clears throat> expected, but still on a real basis negative. And I think this is really the, the key question. This is key. Thank you. That the yes. general trend is lower. So even though better than <clears throat> expected, still on a non-inflation adjusted level, an actual headline retail sales advance month over month is 0.4% versus the expectation of 0.8%. The control group, better than that, 0.7%, but still, again, <clears throat> On a right. real basis, still negative. And this needs some adjustment. As Michael McKee looks at 85 lines that come out within this report, he'll have that all broken down. Michael McKee, inflation is really a significant dynamic here, isn't it? Yes, it has been, Tom. And that's one of the reasons we're looking also at the control group, aside from the fact that some of these things are accounted for differently in GDP. But it also takes out gasoline. And gasoline's been a big mover for the retail sales number over the past couple of months because it's been going up and down. It's one reason that we saw a decline last month. And it's a reason that we saw a rise this month in retail sales because gasoline station sales <laughs> fell on the month by 4%, uh, percent, right. it looks like. Uh, so... Uh, that that makes a big difference out yeah. there. Uh, the uh, other categories that uh, move significantly, though, were general merchandise stores. And uh, I think what you have here is uh, between the, Mar uh, the April and May numbers, or uh, April and uh, March numbers, rather, is uh, Easter effect. Easter was early in April this year. So some of the spending that would right. have taken place in March moves over to April, and you want to average that out. But overall, I think the bottom line that uh, Lisa <coughs> brought up about inflation still mm -hmm. playing a role is there. But you also have to look at the fact that consumers are still spending, and we aren't uh, seeing necessarily mm -hmm. any signs of recession in the retail sales figures. Mike, you're going to get in your 36 holes on Amelia Island here, helping out the Atlanta Fed, and you're also going to be in conversation with the McKinseyite Barkin and also the academic from Chicago, Goolsby. These are two important, different conversations. Let's focus on Austin Goolsby, who's someone reticent to raise rates higher. Do I have that right? That is correct. He's more worried about the fact that the Fed has done so much that it wouldn't take much to tip the economy into recession. So he's been saying he thinks maybe a pause is a good idea. Stop and look around and see what's going on. We'll be asking him what would change his mind on that because we do have a couple of inflation reports before the next Fed meeting. Mike McKee, thank you uh, so much. Really appreciate that uh, this morning. It's really important here, I think, to look at the retail data, rip it apart. And someone that can do that, of course, is the gentlelady from PIMCO, Lisa. And this really uh, is the question, especially after we were talking about a discretionary recession. Are we seeing that in the data? Joining us someone who's, is someone who focuses on this all day, every day. Tiffany Wilding, economist at PIMCO, 5.30 a.m. there, local time. Thank you for waking up uh, and keeping Eastern time so that you can partake. But I'm curious, Tiffany, from your vantage point, are you seeing signs of some sort of discretionary recession or is that premature? Yeah, well, I mean, I do think that the consumer, some of the momentum in consumption has decelerated since the beginning of the year. So, you know, Jan or, uh, the first quarter was extremely strong in terms of consumption growth, um, over 3%. You know, but a lot of that, as we know, um, if we look at the sequential monthly data, um, it was really boosted by warm weather in January. And then we saw a deceleration in March, and it looks like we're getting a little bit of a pop back. But but as, as Michael suggested, there's probably some noise around Mother's Day here. So you kind of have to smooth that over. Um, you know, so we would suggest you are seeing some some decline or, or um, you know, uh, growth deceleration um, in consumption. But overall, you know, as, as was said, the consumers are hanging in there. You know, and of course, that's also going to be a function of the labor market. You know, and it is still um, it is still reasonably strong.
hanging in there and willing to pay the prices that are being demanded are two different things. Is there a sense that there really is starting to be some pushback to the inflation that's being borne out in consumers' pocketbooks and in the fattening margins of profits at companies? Yeah, well, so, I mean, we're definitely starting to hear more of that coming from, um, you know, the various earnings releases from some of the consumer companies. Um, you know, they're saying, obviously, that uh, consumers are a little bit more price sensitive in various categories. I, I would say when, when I look at the macro data, um, you know, I, I don't see it as much. And, of course, we need more macro data. You know, if we're starting to see these trends at the company level, they're noticing it, you know, then it'll come out with the macro data with a lag. Um, you know, but but overall, I would say inflation is actually still, um, you know, still reasonably robust. I mean, obviously, at 5 percent or more, it's over the Fed's target. Um, you know, we do expect it to come down. Um, but it's been I think it's been continues to be stickier than expected. Tiffany, I'm, I need to ask you this because in the equity market, I've been looking at the slow motion convergence of moving averages down to what Lisa and I call a snooze fest. I got the same thing in the bond market. If I look at the two-year yield, there's a teensy-weensy two-basis point differential in the three moving averages I use. Does Jerome Powell call that a success to see the lethargy, <laughs> the boredom within the bond market described by the two-year yield? Um, well, you know, I, I, you know, I do think that the bond market does listen to the Fed. Um, you know, I think sometimes commentators like to look at, you know, just the forward curve, which is, which does suggest, um, you know, a significant probability um, that rates will be lower by the end of the year to suggest that, you know, the markets aren't listening to the Fed. Um, I do think the markets are, are listening to the Fed, but I, I just think the markets probably have, um, you know, their, in terms of their distribution of risks, they, they assign more downside risk to the economic outlook. Uh, than the Federal Reserve does. Um, if you take a historical look at, at banking sector crises and stresses defined right. by you know 30 percent drops on average in banking shares, you do see <laughs> tend to see the economy decelerating after that. Um, you know that'll that'll of course come right. from tighter credit conditions for consumers and households. What do you hear from then your Pimco portfolio managers without giving away the crown jewels? What does Pimco say about the dynamics in this banking crisis in agency paper? <laughs> yeah, well, of course, there's some, um, you know, banks that failed, obviously held, um, you know, they held a lot of treasuries as well as agencies, you know, obviously that will need to be sold. We think that's probably priced into the market, though. Um, there's a pretty good understanding of exactly what that is, mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of the how much it is, you know, and obviously the Federal Reserve is also shrinking its portfolio, um, you know, but on the other side of that, um, the, you don't have a refinancing wave <laughs> because uh, interest rates are so high. So overall, we think it's it's priced in. We actually like agency MBS. Um, we think that they actually provide pretty good value uh, right now, just because volatility has been high and the level of interest rates are high, and those things can can mean revert back down. As we prepare for a slew of retail earnings, particularly tomorrow with respect to Target and then Walmart, do we get a sense that perhaps people are too bearish that Home Depot was an outlier and that otherwise, to your point, the consumers are still spending and they can keep borrowing to do so? Well, um, I mean, so the, the data that we got some credit data from, from the Federal Reserve, um, which did look like there was some reduction in, in credit card uh, uh, or, or there, there was a deterioration in, in credit card loans and things like that. Um, in the first quarter. Um, you know, so I do think there are consumers out there that are, are feeling pain, um, and I do think banks are tightening credit conditions. You know, the, the other piece of this, obviously, is just demand for credit, um, and demand for credit is also falling just because rates are so high. Um, you, you obviously, it's more expensive to take out loans, et cetera. So, you know, all of this to me is suggestive that, you know, monetary policy is working. Um, you know, the consumer, you know, ultimately it is, they are getting squeezed, some of the lower income consumers more so than others. Um, you know, and, and you are seeing some deceleration in, in credit growth as a result of, of the current environment. So as you put this all together, is inflation decelerating enough to really get the Fed where they want? Or are we looking at a sort of higher inflation but also higher growth kind of area for a longer period of time? Yeah, I mean, I think that's yet to be seen. Um, you know, as I as I mentioned, we do think this banking sector uh, stress is is going to impact the economy. It's going to slow things down. H higher interest rates take time to work their th their way through the economy with a lag. Um, and you know, I would even say inflation even lags. Uh, you know 
activity uh, momentum. So growth. So you know, we, we I think we're we're seeing these lags start to play out. You are you have seen inflation decelerate. It's probably going to continue to decelerate given the monetary policy restriction that's in place, and the Federal Reserve you know just needs to be patient as does markets. Just needs to be patient to see that. <coughs> Um, you know, so we think inflation does decelerate to 3% um, core CPI, for example, by year end, um, three to three and a half. Um, you know, but obviously that's still above target. Um, there's still some sticky trends in inflation, you know, but ultimately the Fed probably will be successful in, in, in getting it back. The question is, you know, how, you know, how big of a recession do they need to do that, I think. Thank you. Uh, Tiffany Wild, greatly appreciate it with PIMCO. Right now we're going to drop into the Brahma world. We can do that right now. And I just did this really quickly, uh, Lisa. I'm an amateur compared to you. I, I brought up Apple Computer, and I went out 10 years, like a 10-year benchmark, the 4.3% coupon. And I'm picking up 76 basis points, 75.9 basis points over the Treasury. I mean, that's the real world of all of our guests, is they're trying to make that teen sweet amount over treasuries. You do that with Apple. And a lot of those big-name blue <clears throat> chip companies are selling debt right now because they're not having to pay that much of an extra over margin treasury. over treasuries I, because I people are saying, oh, you guys are going to be just fine. I can't emphasize enough, folks, how the world has changed. There's a coupon out there. All of a sudden, total return and coupons matter. Very different. Futures at negative 11. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The White House and congressional leaders head into another session of debt limit talks today to try and avoid a default. President Biden has said he was optimistic a deal could be reached, while White House Speaker Kevin McCarthy expressed that ongoing discussions were not productive at all and leaders are nowhere near reaching an agreement. Bloomberg's learned that Saudi Arabia is moving closer to another stock offering in Aramco, the oil giant. Any deal would be one of the world's largest share sales in years. Proceeds from the sale would be transferred to the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund. The former CEO of Silicon Valley Bank says the Fed and social media contributed to the lender's collapse. Greg Becker testifies before the Senate Banking Committee today. He's expected to blame the fastest pace of hikes by the Fed in decades. According to prepared remarks, Becker also will point a finger at negative social media sentiment. A special counsel faulted the FBI and Justice Department's probe into whether Donald Trump's campaign conspired with Russia in the 2016 election. Still, John Durham failed to issue any new charges or recommend significant changes to investigative procedures. The former president had claimed that Durham would reveal a conspiracy to undercut his presidency. A group of senior officials from Tesla are visiting India this week, looking to expand its supply chain beyond China. The visit could represent a thaw in the relationship. Tesla CEO Elon Musk has criticized India's high import taxes and its electric vehicle policies. India has advised Tesla not to sell cars in the country that have been made in China, its political adversary. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. It's very clear that the consumer is on fragile footing, but they're proving resilient, at least temporarily. Consumers are increasingly willing and accepting of that level of inflation. But going forward, it's all going to come down to that stockpile of wealth and the ability for the consumer to make purchases in the marketplace. At some point, those savings, that wealth runs out and businesses won't be able to pass on that cost increase without a significant loss of market share. Very valuable yesterday. Lindsay Piegza with us, the Stiefel chief economist there on the state of the American economy. Lisa, she was talking about Atlanta GDP now with a run rate of two-ish percentage, and you wonder off retail sales today where that will end up, where that will settle. Again, resilience, which has been sort of the conundrum that a lot of people have been dealing with. If you've got resilience and growth, does that also mean resilience of inflation, which creates, which creates a real conundrum for the Federal Reserve? Off retail sales productivity yields higher, 4.02% on the five-year. Ten-year yield 3.52%. Uh, Equities have vacillated today. I'm going to call it on an SPX of negative 9. 
maybe not as gloomy as the shock of Home Depot and the same store sales missed there, Lisa, but there's a little weight to the tape today. Is how there's I'd put a nudginess, as you would say. I and like you know, that. How yeah. much is this really Kevin McCarthy coming out and saying that there's no deal, no, so that tail risk isn't off? You then have China and the situation where you get data overnight that shows that growth really isn't so even. Right. It's kind of sputtering, and it's not going to persist without some sort of government support. I think you're dead on on China. I do think it moved the markets today, and we're going to get a brief on that right now. I've been remiss not to do that through a busy morning. And the current joins us in Washington, of course, with these years of experience in Hong Kong and, and, and living the Chinese uh, escape from COVID. He is our global economics correspondent. And uh, I looked at the nuance of a property market worser. What was worser for you in the report of China? It, disappointment across the board, Tom. Look at youth unemployment up towards 20.4%, uh, another record level. 12 odd million graduates coming onto the marketplace in China this year. That's going to be a real concern for China's recovery. Of course, then you had retail sales missing forecasts, industrial production missing forecasts. And by the way, they were being compared against a weak base from a year ago as well. So really uh, soft numbers for China across the board. And you'd have to say probably disappointing. Remember a few months ago, we were all talking about, wow, China's reopening now. Let's see where these rocket boosters go in terms of cons consumption and industrial production. How does it spill over? How will it impact global inflation and everything else? All legitimate questions at the time. But here we are now in May, and it's, uh, looking, like it's, some it's looking like something of a fizzer, so to speak. Well Unless there is some sort of investment by the government, unless there is some sort of support or stimulus, how much discussion is there about the PBOC, about uh, the Chinese Communist Party coming out and injecting more cash into the economy? There is always discussion around uh, more public support for the economy, Lisa, for sure. I think one of the critical takeaways, though, will be what's happening with youth unemployment in particular. We know, of course, how job creation is the modus operandi of the government there. We've had some comments from the, from the official sector. Our, our colleagues in Beijing were reporting on making the point that they will be taking steps to ensure jobs are created. Some economists are making the point that the recovery kind of favoured low-end services workers rather than, say, uh, more educated workers up the value chain. Those are the ones that are losing out this time around. That certainly won't be an easy story to fix given the broader uh, you know, ten difficulties that China's technology sector is facing given the US tensions. So I think there, there might be more support coming, but you know, an interest rate cut isn't, isn't going to turn this around. Clearly, youth unemployment needs to be addressed, and obviously broad or government spending will be needed to pick up the investment side of things. So if anyone was waking up today and hoping that we'd get some clarity on the soup of data and storylines that we've been getting over the past six months, you're wrong. You're not going to get it because there, we've not only got this uh, this data out of China that shows some sort of, I don't want to say slowdown, but a choppy recovery. You get the IEA coming out and saying, actually, Chinese oil demand is increasing dramatically <laughs> and is going to really support oil uh, pricing. So how do you square this circle? Well, this was meant to be the big, this was the talking point of the year. Uh, China comes back online. They are the world's biggest purchaser of oil. Uh, Chinese travel, both consumer and business level, would, would have an impact on global oil prices. But obviously, uh, it's there. It's offering some support in that market. Uh, analysts talk about it every day of the week. But we can't say I think China is offering a major fresh impulse to the global inflation story, <clears throat> at right. least at least not at, le at least not yet, Lisa. And I want to go to your wheelhouse coverage in Hong Kong of the fears that the West has through Hong Kong over all of China. This president begins a three-nation Indo-Pacific tour. It is Japan, Amory Horton will be there, folks, Papua New Guinea, and then I believe down to Australia. An exhausting trip. There's no end of for buts about it. And one of the major goals here is to contain technology placement in and out of China with our allies. Can we do that? Can we actually control the technology movement of our allies into a nation that we fear? Well, there's no doubt that the U.S. export controls and restrictions on investment have certainly been hampering parts of China's economy, in particular the semiconductor sector. Some companies, especially caught in those crosshairs, for example, like Huawei was one example, and some U.S. allies have been on board for that story as well. But you'd have to say at the same time, we've been reporting and others are reporting that there's also signs of resilience in China's high-tech sector, in the semiconductor sector, among <clears> some of those individual companies that have been impacted, like Huawei. So the question of what, you know, about whether or not the U.S. can 
kneecap right. China's high tech development, I think, remains an open one. But clearly, more measures are expected still to come from the White House. The distinction and uh, this morning seems to be a recovering China versus an industrial China. Do you buy that? Is that the dichotomy we should be looking at? Uh, well, I think, you know, the biggest surprise has been the, the sort of slow rebound of consumers. Uh, you know, the, the Western story was pent up demand after after they moved past the brunt of the COVID restrictions. That hasn't really played out in China. Maybe it's because it was a different dynamic. The COVID zero meant there was no COVID there for a couple of years and people were out and about as they normally would. So perhaps we should never have expected that kind of V-shaped rebound to begin with. But nonetheless, I think the slow recovery and the fragile confidence of the Chinese con consumer doesn't bode well for China's economic recovery and certainly doesn't bode well as spilling over for the rest of the world in terms of global demand either. I think China's slowdown, coupled with the noise coming out of Germany's industrial production side of things, uh, it all points to, I think, slowing momentum as we head into the second half of this year. As you're speaking, we're getting some headlines from Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester in some prepared remarks as she uh, speaks at an event in Dublin, Ireland. She's talking about how data shows us that rates are not at a sufficiently restrictive level. She talks about how monetary policy must consider long-run economic trends and that they are committed to returning inflation to 2%, but not yet at a level to hold given the stubborn inflation. Uh, given the fact that we have heard something of a break in views on the Federal Reserve and uh, from an economics perspective, is that the case, that it's not necessarily clear whether monetary policy is at a restrictive, sufficiently restrictive level? Well, again, this is the big question. I mean, the U.S. has certainly got a lot of balls in the air right now, Lisa, when you consider what's going on with the banking shock and how that may or may not impact lending as we go forward in the months ahead, especially for small, the smaller business community. We've had five-odd percentage points of interest rate increases here in just over a year. There are plenty of economists who say, look, te textbooks say that's going to come down the tracks at some point sooner or later and hit consumers and households and business, businesses. And then, of course, we have the debt ceiling, debate. There is a sanguine view that, that that will all be navigated. Markets aren't really panicking yet. But nonetheless, it's certainly a pretty serious debate to be having for any, any government. And now to your point, some Fed officials are saying interest rates still aren't where they need to be. They need to go higher. Well, of course, there are plenty of people warning that the Fed has already gone far enough, that they're only storing up trouble for down the road. It's a very academic question as to where you know, where you do actually hit restrictive territory, where the new neutral rate is, so to speak, as well, Lisa. But either way, I think it's a big call for the Fed now in terms of how they balance this going forward. And a current, thank you so much. In Washington uh, this morning, futures negative 11, a little weight to the tape here as, as well. There's Fed speakers and then there's Loretta Mester. I'm sorry, I'm going to treat her differently. They're all different. Barkin with Mike McKee, Goolsby with Mike McKee, two very different individuals. And then there's the mathematician Mester, who has a concision the other two don't. It really flies in the face of market expectations that the Fed is done, the pause is about to happen, and then they're going to keep on going. It also shows she's not ready to pause. We heard something different from Raphael Bostic, who is saying all things being equal right now, to Michael McKenna's conversation yesterday. He is ready to pause. So, again... This real difference, do we see that in dissents coming out in the Fed? I think we'll see it in the data. They're all, the, well, the common ground of Austin Goolsby and Jim Bullard is their data dependent. Which I mean, data? They're simple. all looking at different data. They're looking at different data, but far more importantly, on an ex post basis, they got to get out and after the fact, get in the data and by definition be after the fact. And to get out here, he's going to close the show. I can go to FOMC Go, so can Lisa. June 14th, July 26th. Where are we going to be November 1? I, I got a clue. <laughs> Where are we going to be no, I have June no 14th. Clue. Yeah, June 14th. Maybe we'll get to Memorial Day weekend. Michael McKee with Barkin and Goolsby from Amelia Island. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg.